It all comes down to this, and the stakes couldn't be higher. As the NBA season comes to an end, the play-in tournament is upon us, and the NBA playoffs are fast approaching. There's no shortage of action and big games to get in on to win some cash. So shout out our partner DraftKings, who are bringing you a brand new way to play daily sports fantasy with Pick 6. All new customers get up to $200 in Pick 6 credits if your first pick set loses. Pick two to six players and choose if they're going to have more or less of a stat. Track your lineup and compete against others for a shot at huge cash prizes. Getting started is simple. Download the DraftKings Pick 6 app, sign up using the code SMOKE. That's right. With code SMOKE, all new customers get $200 in Pick 6 credits. If your first pick set misses, don't stress. You'll get $200 in Pick 6 credits. That's code SMOKE, only at DraftKings Pick 6. The crown is yours. Basketball fans, it's that bittersweet time of the year. The NBA season is coming to a close, and the playoff picture is starting to come into focus. So if you're looking to hit a regular season game, you're at the buzzer. But I got great news for you. You can still score last-minute tickets and last-minute deals with the Game Time app. This is where Game Time comes in clutch. I've seen these last-minute deals on games up to 60% off. Game Time has the lowest price, guaranteed. If you find tickets in the same row or section for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Part of the Game Time guarantee is event cancellation protection, 24-hour returns, and job assurance. Life happens. Plans change. People bail. I've been there. But Game Time always has me covered. So when I'm buying tickets, I eliminate the guesswork and the frustration with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. And use code SMOKE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code SMOKE. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Welcome back, all the smoke. Jack, we got a good one today. We've been waiting on this, bro. Come on, man. Legend in the game, um, MC, actor. Man, you name it, he does it. Buster Ron. Legend. Oh man. Salute. Legend. Legend. Salute. Salute. Legend. Salute. Yeah. Episode. Yeah. Salute Legend to the episode. Episode. Dropped the new project in November. Uh talk to us about that. Yeah, the name of the new album is Blockbuster. And ironically, the name originally came from I mean, we know the obvious with the video store and shit, but Q Tip one day told me that I should name the album Blockbuster. So big up the Q-tip from Tribe Called Quest, rest in peace, Fife Dog. Mm-hmm. But the, the the funny shit is, probably like four or five months later, as I was talking to Swiss, he felt like I should name the, the album Blockbuster. Mind you, he never talked to Q-tip. It was two separate conversations, two different places. So that was like a, 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 a some divine shit going on. So um, I decided to call it that, but but, I think the most incredible part about the album is just the, the 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 love and the support of how my bros from 25 years and better, which is Swiss Timberland and Pharrell, came together and decided to to assist me on executive producing the overall project, and um, that shit actually came about from us just chilling on a yacht in Miami. Pharrell, you know, he had a day with. The family, he was just chilling and he invited us to come and pull up. And this was right after, it was actually while Swiss was completing DMX last album, Rest in Peace to the Dog. So we on a boat and we listening to DMX album and we about four hours into the, the yacht experience and I'm looking at these motherfuckers and I'm like, ain't none of us gonna talk about doing a project together? This shit crazy than a motherfucker. Like, I ain't gonna sit here looking at all of y'all and not at least bring this shit up. You know what I'm saying? Like my bro's been a part of all of my projects at one point or another, whether it's two out of the three of them or one out of the three of them. And um, when I mentioned it, it started off as an idea to just do an EP. Six joints, two beats from each producer, and that was it. So then when they gave me the six beats, I still felt so inspired that I kept working on songs with other artists. And I think it was around the time when the first BET Awards happened post COVID, motherfuckers ain't get to see each other for like two years because all that shit was shut down. And 
I think motherfuckers were just so happy to see each other. Everybody was just pulling up on each other in each other's studio sessions. And I got most of my collab work done for this album during that time. So by the time it got to like 30 records, I just had so much incredible and eventful moments that I would send all of them to joints, being that, you know, it was understood that they was going to co-executive produce the album with me. I wanted them to be a part of every decision-making process. So they was a part of every decision-making process. And what ended up becoming a body of work was a collective decision-making. I wouldn't say it was a smooth, you know, there was a lot of shit like, motherfucker, you need to take that one off. Mm -hmm. Be some shit that I was married to and be like, get the fuck up out of here. I want to keep this record. And they'd be like, nah, son, save that for another moment. But it's mm -hmm. like, you know, these children, these these records is like your kids when you make mm. these shits. You know what I'm saying? You put your time into it. You tweak shit. You sit and wait until it's the right time to put it out. And then you share it with the world. So it's like when the project was done and big up to everybody that participated Quavo and Coyle Ray and Bia and uh, Chris Brown, Shinsia, Giggs, Blue Vandross, Blast, Moray, my kids, um, T Pain. Did I say the baby? Nope. Mm -mm. The baby. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the producers. You know, it, it just really came together as a as a, a incredible body of work of just feel good energy, throw the fucking couches around when you in a club, swing from the chandeliers, hanging from the ceiling and shit, and just have a good time. And and I felt like it was a great, a great way to come after the Extinction Level Event 2 album, because when I did that album, we released it in the middle of the pandemic. That came 2020, October. So, you know, you we were speaking directly to the shit that was going on and motherfuckers was frustrated. You know what I'm saying? We looking at the shit you was fighting for with George Floyd crazy and we looking at the the, the, the riots and the fucking protests and, you know, just the divide with the whole shit with the, you can't be around motherfuckers if you ain't got a mask. You can't be yeah. around motherfuckers if you ain't got a vaccine shot. It's like this shit just felt like segregation again. Yep. But. Once we got back outside and motherfuckers just was really appreciative of some shit that you take for granted, right. mm -hmm. the little civil liberties that motherfuckers really don't think could ever disappear in two seconds, you got to really see the joy. And, and, and in addition to that, for me, I think like, I'm just at a place in my life where not only am I excited that I'm still passionate and still love this shit, and we'll still bust anybody ass who mm. wants smoke. Talk mm. that shit. Mm. But I'm enjoying doing this shit with my children. Yeah. That's a different you know feeling. What I'm saying? That's the illest feeling in the planet for mm -hmm. me because I remember rocking and missing so much shit, you know, when they was young, because they couldn't hang out. They was too small. Yeah. Now they all grown. They not only can hang out and shit, they can actually participate because my kids, they they get busy and they I got a son that All of them into it? Not to cut you off. All of them into it somehow, some way? Yeah. Really? I got, I got a son that produced that actually taught the youngest one how to rhyme because he was rhyming first. So the one that rhymes on the song called Legacy on the album, my, my middle son taught him and then started to produce instead of being an MC. My oldest son is the executive. And by the way, he, he, he really, really made it his, his business to understand finances so it's like he he ended up evolving in such an amazing way in that space that he works for BlackRock you know what I'm saying so my daughter plays I got a daughter that plays classical piano I got a daughter that sings I got a son that rhyme my youngest son he the only one that ain't really too much into the music shit he he trying to be like y'all y'all his heroes yeah <laughs> nice with ball and shit yeah. you know what I'm saying you got six six yeah, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. six that's well, a lot you got Wu Tang Clan out here. Come on, baby. <laughs> Word, right? I got one up on both of y'all. Five and a, and, a, and, a, and a six man. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I got one up on Word. both of y'all. <laughs> um, how do you feel like your what what has been the what's the process been like from the first to the to, to the latest as far as in the studio thought process? Understand you have to continue to evolve to stay relevant. You've been in this game 30 plus, yeah, you know bro. what I mean? And still listened to, still respected. Thank you. How has your process evolved um, each time you've gone in and, and to where you are now? 
I think for like the first four albums, especially because they were so conceptually driven, all, all of the albums are conceptually driven. Like I, I was a, and, and still am always like, I, I was raised to not take shit on face value. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm I'm from the the era of when it was cool to be smart motherfuckers, mm -hmm. and the five percent nation of the gods and earths was very present. And Zulu yes. nation was very present. Yes, and you know, groups like Public Enemy and Daylight and Tribe and Poor Righteous Teachers and X Clan mm -hmm. was the shit. Yeah, not just culturally, but in the club too. Right. So I'm, I'm from that shit. So for me. You know, reading between the lines and, and understanding shit that they don't show you was the shit that we dug deeper than want to get the information on. So approaching shit creatively, which is why the album was called The Coming and When Disaster Strikes and Extinction Level Event, all of this shit that sounded like end of the world shit. My process took a lot of research and a lot of writing pen to paper. You know what I'm saying? As time passed, but I always balanced it with making sure that I gave you some, 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 some just straight heat. Like it was always a good balance of science and and heat. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's obviously easier to do the heat shit because it ain't so deep research wise. The the evolution from then to now for me is the writing stopped. You know what I'm saying? Like the time that it would take for me to put what I'm going to say anyway on the microphone and then put it on the paper, I just say it. Mm -hmm. Because if I got to say it anyway to write the shit, you might as well just say it and tell the engineer to press record and you capturing the shit that you're going to write on paper anyway. Right. Plus, I used to get annoyed like a motherfucker. At, if I would write a rhyme a certain way and I get to like, if it's a 16 bar verse, I get to like the 14th bar and I ain't saying the rhyme over and over, I might have forgot the rhyme pattern flow-wise that I had for the fourth bar and be mad as a motherfucker that I didn't just say it. You know what I'm saying? So now I got to try to remember how I concocted the flow so that the shit just would fall in the pocket of the beat the way that I initially penned it. So now, <laughs> I, I, shit I just go in the studio All now right. and I'll sit here just like this. I'm not standing in the mic booth no more. Getting too old for all that I shit. I sit down now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and don't get it fucked up. Ain't nothing wrong with my knees or my ankles. <laughs> my back. Oh, everything you know is my good. can't wait to twist you know shit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just cozy than a motherfucker yeah. in a stool. Yeah, it's yeah. like the crib now. It don't yeah. feel like the workplace no more. Straight yeah. up. So that's another thing. It's just having a, 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 a pleasurable experience when I go in now. It's like, if I feel like I'm overthinking that shit, I ain't supposed to be recording that song no more. I walk away from it and I'll revisit the shit the next day when I'm excited about it again. So every song that I'm making now is just coming from a good energy space. It's like what they call that shit, the greatest catch or the deadliest catch. Yeah. That TV show. The the deadliest catch. Deadliest catch. To try to catch the mm -hmm. crab and shit. It's the same process. I just ain't risking my life in no fucking ocean and possibly dying, falling over in the water and drowning and not catching nothing. But yeah, I go in the studio and I throw my fishnet in the universe. Mm. And if I catch a vibe like a motherfucker, then that mean I caught the most crab that night. Right. <laughs> if I don't catch a vibe, I just take my ass back to the crib. And you know, I don't look at it as a loss because I go in there with nothing in my head anyway. I let the music in the moment inspire the vibe. Or, was uh was the single with you and the baby? Was that your first single off the off the album? Nah, that was actually. The third. Third, okay, because yeah, I've seen the, the first video. One was, the, the first one was with Carly, Bia. Bia, okay. The second one was with Corley, Corley Ray. Ray. yeah, then and that then one. And the baby came with the day of the album release. Yeah, the reason why I asked about that because you are a big influence on him when he, the way he shoot his videos. Oh, absolute. A huge, a huge influence. Did y'all ever talk about that? And it's dope to see, it's refreshing to see, because it was, once you kind of stop, But to it, see him it on the gone. video together, yeah, it's, it's right. seeing how, how you started ah, yeah. it to where it is now, yeah, it was beautiful yeah. to see. Thank you so much. I, I love that it's three generations on the song. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and, and T-Pain, you know, he, he definitely was inspired by my work as well. And we've all talked about it because they inspire me too. You know what I'm saying? Like the reason why I fuck with what they do is because they inspire me 
to keep my blade sharp because I can't accept none of them busting my ass on no record. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? So it's like I'm a huge fan of what they do. I love how hard they work. I love how consistent they are. And they feel like we from the same tribe. You know what I'm saying? They feel like kin to me. You know what I mean? So one day the baby was actually, I think, looking at some videos of mine on the computer. And he just hit me in the DM and he was showing me shit that he was looking at that was my videos and was he just sent me a message and was like, yo, bro, you one of the biggest inspirations ever to me when it comes to this visual shit. You set the standard. Thank you so much, man. And and I, I just felt like, you know, for me, when, when it was my turn to finally get the shot, I just didn't wanna, I ain't wanna be one of those dudes that um, the era influenced us. Like you had to be different from the next motherfucker. You wasn't allowed to bite somebody else's shit, look like somebody else's shit, sound like somebody else's shit. And, and you know, when I was young, I was a cartoon fanatic. So the animations and shit that I would watch, whether it was Tom and Jerry or some Woody Woodpecker shit or Bugs Bunny or whatever the fuck, Transformers, Voltron. I'm looking at all of this shit and I'm like, yo, if I was one of them niggas, how would I do it? Then I get in front of that camera and I would create my way of doing whatever I felt. If I had the opportunity to do it when I was watching they shit, what would I do? And that's how the videos came, like put your hands on my eyes to see. I'm looking at the, the, the coming to America shit. I'm like, if I was Eddie Murphy, I'd do it like this. <laughs> Lethal weapon and shit. We did the dangerous video. I paint my face like the white dude. Like, what, what's his name again? Uh, Mel, Mel Gibson. Gibson. Mel Gibson. I'm like, yeah. if I was this motherfucker, this is the way I would do it. The Janet Jackson video, Terminator 2 with the liquid robot. If I was that motherfucker, this is the way I would do it. So this is how the ideas would come. I'm just a big movie and TV buff. I, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired a lot by other shit that's happening in entertainment. And I think that's the beauty of the art. Like it, we all should be able to inspire each other if you contribute in great shit. You rap like you rap into for a score of a movie. Thank you, bro. That's that's because like when you when your videos, when you, you make your videos, it seems like the way you rap and you rapping like to to put it into vision, so you know, something for people to see it. Like everything you write is for a video. Thank you, bro. And I try to do it that way because I want you to see what I'm saying, even if I don't get a chance to shoot a visual for it. Yeah. We can't shoot a video for every song, especially right. the way my shit was costing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm I was breaking the motherfucking back every time we shot some shit. So it was like, you know, for the shit that I can't get around to shooting, I want to make sure that even when I get to perform it on stage, I can sell that shit visually in the illest way live because I'm painting these pictures through the bars that I can actually deliver in my performance. And you get the chance to see the shit, whether I'm performing live or you get to see it from what you're hearing. And I, I really got inspired in that way by NWA. You know what I'm saying? like. That's straight out of Compton and uh, the Niggas For Life album. When I listened to those albums, those was the first albums where I actually thought I was watching a movie when I listened to it. From the way they did their skits to the way Dre would mix shit. And you know how in a movie sometimes when you sitting in that motherfucker and you hear some shit that happened on one speaker and then when the car drive past, you hear the shit pan over to the next speaker. Mm. Like the nigga Dre be doing that shit in his mixes at a time when motherfuckers wasn't doing it. So I just thought this motherfucker was on some real, um, um, what's this dude that be, he scores movies and he does, I forget his, Hans Zimmer. First guess? Hans fucking Zimmer. <laughs> Dre is that Big to me in hip hop. We're gonna talk about that later. <laughs> 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 Words. So yeah, I, I try to create that and paint that picture for the people so they just get to enjoy. I just want to make sure that the shit ain't being done in vain. I'm not one of them motherfuckers where I'm just making it for me. I could do this shit and sit in the crib and play rewind all fucking day and listen to it myself if I'm just making it for me. 
I'm making it for the planet. I want to affect motherfuckers in the whole world with the shit that I might catch a blunt munchie behind or mm-hmm. a bowl of cereal. <laughs> <laughs> you know that this idea right here that was inspired by this blunt munchie mm. fucked the whole planet right. up. Shook the world. You know All what I'm right. saying? Your, uh, your, your style, your, your energy, your tempo, where did that come from? The combination of it came from absolutely hip hop. You know, hip hop was the, the the first art that I actually fell in love with. I wanted to do everything in that motherfucker. I was able to break dance. I was nice at that. I was nice at popping. I was I was all right with the graffiti shit. I was all right with the DJ shit. And then when I was forced to rhyme circumstantially, I think those circumstances forced me to become a dangerous motherfucker lyrically. And um, I think prior to the hip hop shit, which I'll get back to why circumstantially I was forced to rhyme. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of what I ended up in, in, incorporating in my being an artist as an MC repping hip hop was dance hall culture and, and, and my Jamaican upbringing. Because before I was even starting to rhyme, you know, my family is Jamaican, so in order for me to go outside or do shit, you gotta do certain things to earn your right to being able to go out the crib. You gotta clean your motherfucking bedroom, you gotta spread your bed, you gotta you gotta do your homework, you gotta make sure all the little chores and shit in the crib is done. And the, the way that I would pass the time doing shit like that was always listening to the music that my moms and my pops had in the crib. In the crib, they used to always have the illest collection of Jamaican music. Or R&B shit. You, the only American shit you probably find in the crib was Kenny Rogers, <laughs> Michael Jackson, and motherfucking maybe some jazz shit, right? Other than that, everything was Bob Marley and Dennis Brown and Big Youth and and Michigan and Smiley and like these is all like legendary whalers. The whalers. The the, the these is legendary. Jamaican and reggae artists. I'm listening to this shit left and right while I'm trying to do the shit that I needed to do so I could go outside and fuck with the homies. So between that and then as I got older and I started to watch like the the sound clashes in dance halls, which was like battles, right? And you would see Shaba Ranks and Super Cat and they had a dude named um, Papa San and another dude named Lieutenant Stitchy. Them two was actually the first dudes I ever really heard do the speed rap shit. This was in 86. They had a battle at this shit called Sting. And these motherfuckers was going so crazy with the speed rap that that's where I first seen it and tried it. What so year I, was this year, remember? This, this was 1986. Like you could Google 86. it right now. Papa San versus L- Lieutenant Stitchy. Actually, there's an artist that's out right now that works very closely with Cool and Dre and Hitmaker. His name is Bean. That's Papa San's son. Mm. And he's nice. You know what I'm saying? But Papa San and Lieutenant Stitchy was the first two that I ever seen speed rap. 96. I ended up trying that shit in 93 on the second leader's album on a song called Daily Reminder. And that's the first time I ever did a speed rap. Would that be a different term for it, speed rap? I don't know if that was the term. Cause I don't remember calling it speed rap, but it wasn't called no regular rap shit rap, neither. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it was no it name for no it. It wasn't no regular, it wasn't no real name for it. Yeah. It was just, could you do this? Yeah. And I was getting busy, but I wasn't at the level that I eventually evolved into now. But um, it was really just a combination of the dance hall shit because when you would watch a Shaba during those days in the 80s, this is straight Reaganomics era, all the crack being sold everywhere in the hood, and you would see these motherfuckers on these DVDs or these vide- videotapes, and we would cut school and go to these hooky parties, and we would go and see the motherfucking bootleggers that were selling these shits on the street in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, and we would get these shits we get our little 20 bag of chocolate towel we eat. Niggas is rolling they shit up in the, the slowest burning cigar. And you fucking in the crib and we at the hooky parties and 
We fucking around with the homies. We fucking around with the chicks. We watching these shits on the videotape. We smoking, everybody bugging. You would see these dudes perform. They kicking their feet all over the place. They throwing their hands all over the place. They wearing mad colorful shit, custom linen shit, big jewelry hanging down to their shin bone. So all of that shit that you see Slick Rick doing come from his Jamaican upbringing, even though he was born in England. Slick Rick moms is Jamaican. My mother and my father's Jamaican. A lot of my family live in England too. But that's that Jamaican shit. That's that dance hall shit. Cool Herc was a Jamaican. Is a Jamaican, excuse me. You know what I'm saying? So I think that the 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 the, the, the dance hall culture and hip hop is kind of like brothers in a sense. But yeah, this the hip hop shit is what gave birth to Busta Rhymes and I incorporated everything else that made me who I am culturally and morally and principally and integrity based into the shit that I did. And I just always wanted the motherfucking have fun and give people that feel good energy. So I was always known for the wild out because I was the same way at the hooky party. I was the same way in school. I was the same way on the block when we was hustling with the homies. I was the same way all the time. Make motherfuckers laugh. I always, every, every, every gangster movie, whether it was Scarface or Goodfellas, one of the most dangerous niggas was the niggas that made you laugh. Mm -hmm. Joe Pesci made niggas laugh. Yeah. He was a loose fucking cannon. Scarface, he made you laugh. Yeah. Come here, pelican, pelican, pelican. <laughs> Tore your ass up though. So, you know, I was always intrigued by the gangster that had a sense of humor. You know what I'm saying? And I was around a lot of motherfuckers that was doing shit that other people might have classified or categorized as terrorism. But those was the same dudes that raised us. Those was the same dudes that taught us integrity. They taught us respect. When the parents got off the school bus, I mean the, 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 the public transportation, whether it was the B-35 on Church Avenue in Troy, or it was, you know, the subway. You see moms, you know, walking up the block with the shopping bags and you blowing treat, nigga, put your weed out, homie. Put the cigarette out, homie, and don't curse when she walk past us. You better help her with her shopping bags too. And if you don't, we gonna fuck you up when she when, she, when we take upstairs and we come back outside. So that shit was important. Like they, they was crazy to many, but it was very civilized to us. And they was the same dudes that, yeah, if they ain't have nothing better to offer, they was gonna guide you while you was doing your dirt too. But at the end of the day, if they seen that you had potential to do some good shit, the motherfuckers will be encouraging you to go over there and do your good shit. Stay away from this shit. Because you might be the one to save the rest of our asses as you get it. You know what I'm saying? But all of that shit combined is what made the Buster Rhymes energy that the people ended up getting and continues to receive. Or High school, you cross big, Jay-Z, special ed. Talk about that high school experience, all them legends in, in one vicinity, man. It was two different schools. Yeah. Me, special ed, and Chip Fu from Fushnikins, we was in a school called Tilden High School in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Me, Biggie, and Jay-Z went to George Westinghouse Technical and Vocational High School. That was downtown Brooklyn. I went to Tilden after Westinghouse. So my mom's, I was getting in trouble when I was 11 and 12 in Brooklyn. So she decided to take me to Long Island. When I got to Long Island, that's when I met leaders of the new school. By the time I turned 15, my mother wanted to move to Florida. I ain't wanna go. So my moms and my pops had a divorce. My pops stayed in Brooklyn. I moved back to my father's crib. When I moved back to my father's crib, where my father lived was in the school district where Tilden was. But because my father is a licensed electrical contractor, he wanted me to go to a trade school. So he ended up finagling it 
So I could go to George Westinghouse Technical and Vocational High School because it was a trade school and he wanted me to learn his trade. He wasn't supportive of the rap shit at the time because, you know, his old Jamaican father, he's on some fuck that rap shit. There ain't, there ain't no future in that. You're going to learn this trade. And I'm, his, I'm the oldest of the two kids that he had, me and my younger brother. But he was in his head, you know, I guess feeling like he's doing the thing that's that worked for him. It, it provided stability for him to provide for the family. And he know this. So if I learn it, whether I like it or not, at least I got some shit to fall back on if whatever else I'm trying to do don't work. I ain't appreciate that shit till later on. You feel me? So that led to a lot of conflict with me and my pops. While I'm in school at Western House, Big wasn't rhyming in school, but he was rhyming. Dangerous motherfucker. He just wasn't doing it in school for niggas to know what was going on. Biggie was bubbling a little, a little weed in school. Hove, we knew he was rhyming because he was already putting joints out with the originators. And um, everybody was getting to their little hustle money. Remember, it's the 80s, so it's Reaganomics ever. So we was all getting to that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, again, one day me and Hove, I don't know how it got put together, but somebody mentioned battle on some speed rap shit. I'm gas thinking that I could fuck with it a little bit because I'm seeing this Papa San and this Lieutenant Stitchy shit mm -hmm. and I'm already practicing this shit a little bit in the crib, but I wasn't really ready to display it. But again, I still wasn't, um, I wasn't concerned of it with none of that. I was with just whatever smokers. So me and Ho, we go, we do our battle thing and I and I took the L that day. That moment is what turned me into the motherfucker that mm. nobody don't want it with now. Mm. Hope don't want to give me no rematch. Yeah. <laughs> Not on that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but but Hove was always just, he was always a fly motherfucker in school. Like he, 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 from the jury game to the clothes, he was always flying. He was always smart. Passed his classes. He wasn't fucking around. And you know, he got to the bread even though he was on his job with his school shit. Mm -hmm. Biggie, same shit. Everybody was on their shit. I ended up dropping out of school because my opportunity came. I was 17 and my moms came back from Florida because she heard what I was doing in the street and she didn't want it to be a guilt that she felt she was living with if something happened to me because she bounced and let me stay. You know that mother's maternal mm -hmm. instinct shit, you know what I'm saying? So she ended up coming back and I moved back to Long Island, but before I moved back to Long Island, I went to Tilden and I got with Special Ed and Chip Fu. Special Ed was the first one to put the records out though. And Special Ed was that and then fly motherfucking. Matt I got it made. Yeah, Matt Barnes yeah. looking at straight up, <laughs> straight up. Oh, Matt Barnes looking at it. Hey, I, I knew this got that good here. The one to bring yeah. it up too. And red skin. Matthew Ed. And and and, and, he, and he had the, the, the chicks was on him, <laughs> and he got busy with his pen, and he had the most legendary producer at the time, which was Hitman Howie T. Like yeah. you couldn't fuck with Howie T. Howie T was doing everything, UTFO shit, Chub Rock shit, Real Roxanne shit. Mm -hmm. It was just everything that was scorching was Howie T and Special Ed, he was the youngest in charge at the time. And it was just incredible to be around all of it because these, these motherfuckers that was getting it, Hove and Special Ed, Hove wasn't doing solo shit yet. You know, he was rocking with Jazzo and with the originators. But when Spe when Special Ed came with his solo shit, it really made this belief and this dream that much more tangible to me. Because I wanted that shit so fucking bad. I was a little nigga. I was staying at this babysitter when my mom used to work nights. Her name was Aunt Mitzi. She had a son named Alfonso. This nigga was one of the illest graffiti artists ever. So in the night, he would go and bomb the subway, but I would watch him prepare in the crib before he would leave. 
So motherfucker would get these like shoe polish. Remember the the roll on the, the the shoe polishes that you would shake and it had the brush on it. And you wipe it on, yeah. You wipe it on your yeah. sh- your, your church sneak shoes yeah. and shit before yeah. you go to church. This motherfucker. And remember when you used to ride on the subways and used to see the tags on the subways with the thick magic markers and the shit would drip oh, it came and dry with the drip. Mm-hmm. So he created those from shoe polish bottles where he would take a chalkboard eraser. And you know, in a chalkboard eraser, it got like five strips of the felt for you to erase the chalk. He would rip a strip of that shit off and bend it. And he could squeeze that shit, He'd take the brush off the shoe polish. He squeeze it in a motherfucking shoe polish, put the top back on, shake it, use the shoe polish as the ink. And then he had the, that's how he made the fat tip magic marker. Now I'm watching this motherfucker do that. My, this is hip hop in front of me. So I'm watching them doing this shit. And back then they had this radio station called WHBI. And on WHBI, it was Africa Islam from the Zulu Nation. Red Alert was spin on there. The Supreme Team who made Buffalo Gals was on that shit. And this shit would come on from like two to five in the morning. So a lot of motherfuckers ain't know that station was coming on at that time. So I'm so hyped to see what Fonzo would come back with story wise and picture wise because they used to take pictures of the shit that they was doing. I would stay up and I would make my pause tapes. Sometimes they would play their battles with the Cold Crush Brothers against the Furious Five or the Cold Crush against the Foursome Seas, the Kumo D battle against Busy B. And these battles was being played live from the actual battle themselves. So you would hear the crowd in the background and the whole shit. And you know, I was too young to be in the street hustling shit because at the time, you know, I'm like fucking nine, 10 years old. I'm with the babysitter, whatever. But still, I want to come to school with the Pumas and the Adidas on, my nigga. I'm lying when I make the pause tape. And when I played this shit in school for motherfuckers, motherfuckers would be like, yo, how you get that? I used to be like, nigga, I was there. Mm-hmm. I was there. I was there, nigga. My cousin stuck me in there, son. You want a copy? Five dollars. And I would sell this and hustle these tapes that I was making from this underground station until I had enough Puma and Adidas money. And that's how I kind of school on my fresh shit. That's, that was the start of my hustling mentality. But, you know, going to school with, with Big and, and Hove and going to school with, with Chip Fu and Special Ed, that shit was really dope for me because I was able to witness firsthand that under 18 motherfuckers was really getting to that it. bag really mm-hmm. doing it. and driving their own fly shit to school and juried up in school and Niggas moms had to sign their deals, bro, because they wasn't 18, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So that's what it was for me. It was just being fortunate enough to be at the right place at the right time and around the right motherfuckers. Sound you know like a mean? magical time. Word. Good old days. Early 90s, would you say the, Afri- the African medallion movement around that time, how do you feel the uh, the state of hip hop got like that? And do you think it ever get back to that point where it's so much unity in hip hop like it was around that time? I don't know. It's hard to say, huh? Yeah, it's definitely hard to say. And, and I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know if it'll ever get back to that unless they allow the success to be lead as an example in that way that will attract motherfuckers to follow the win. Cause motherfuckers is only attracted to the win. So if acting like a savage is winning, motherfuckers is going to follow being savage because they feel like that's the way they going to win. Like I was saying earlier, I come from the era when it was cool to be smart. You know what I'm saying? So having knowledge yourself was important. That's why you had Brand Nubian and X-Clan and Lakim Shabazz and Poor Righteous Teachers and Public Enemy. And you would hear all of these records on the radio. It was so cool to be smooth, to, to be smart. Then they got Ice Cube went from being a gangster to becoming a Muslim. You know what I'm saying? And even though he always repped his gangster shit even with that, you know, he he he, he felt comfortable enough repping something that, that was a direct exemplification of being a civilized motherfucking man. And I, you know, I think Public Enemy and their success had a lot to do with that. And Rakim, you know what I'm saying? And Wu-Tang and 
you know, the, the, the presence of dudes with knowledge itself was super strong. And I think that in addition to that shit being cool, it was cool because it was also a success. Motherfuckers was able to put platinum records on the wall being smart. Motherfuckers was able to get rich being smart. Kane, King Asiatic, you know what I'm saying? Like, and motherfuckers wasn't ODing on drugs and going to jail. Right, a <laughs> different time. And we wasn't beefing. A lot of motherfuckers at the time, we there was just, you ain't really hear about no beef. And if there was a beef, motherfuckers addressed each other because you ain't have no choice. It wasn't no pop shit through the gram because it wasn't <laughs> no social media. See you you had to be you. a little more mindful mm. of what you said because mm. you can run into you a motherfucker and get it. your shit broke for real. Mm. You got to face it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You gotta face the, it. The, the accountability was serious. So it was, it was, you thought before you spoke. Nowadays, obviously, the, the difference is you don't got to earn your right to passage to be heard. We had to earn that shit back in the day. And I'm not saying that it was better then, because there's a lot of shit that's happening now that you can benefit from in a way that we wasn't able to back then too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just think that the evolution and being in tune with the evolution and taking the best from the evolution and being swift and changeable in order, in order to stay remainable is what we ultimately gotta do because if you stay in the same way in any situation or you get stagnant or stuck, you ain't growing no more. Anything that ain't growing no more is dead. Yep. So we gotta take the good with the bad. You know, I, I do think it can happen. I just think we had another Lauren Hill moment Yeah. where the shit she did and how successful it was doing what she did and it wasn't a bunch of none of the shit that we see that's happening and I ain't knocking nobody. But if we had another one of those moments right now that could do the numbers that she did now without having to do the shit that girls feel like they gotta do now in order to get them numbers, right. you see a trillion of them starting to follow her ass because what she did was so magical and it was done without having to exploit shit that could eventually be used against you with time. So I don't rule out the possibility of nothing. You know what I'm saying? I just know all you could do is your part and you hope your part is a significant enough contribution and influence to make a couple motherfuckers want to do it the way you did it, but still make it their own. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Who were your rap influences? I know you said you was big fans of LL and uh, Slick Rick. LL was the dude that made me write my first rhyme circumstantially. I was getting disrespected by the C Brown from Leaders of the New School when I first started the rhyme. <laughs> I, I went still to feel junior, his energy right here. Still bond. I, went yeah, to, yeah. I went to junior high school in Long Island when we first moved out there. And you know, a lot of parents felt like going to the Long Island side of suburbs was the way to get your kids out of the troublemaking mischief they was finding for themselves in the hood. Whether they was from Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, Brooklyn, wherever. They slid us all to Long Island. You, you fucked around and got to Long Island. You ended up being around a bunch of the same motherfuckers from the hood anyway. So you ain't escaped shit. Can't escape it. You ain't escaped shit. So you out there and Brown, you know, when a new kid from the hood came to the island at the time, like there would be little rumblings about the new motherfucker from the hood. So at the time I was getting the rumbling. And Brown, obviously, he ain't want the attention to be taken from him. He's he a Queens kid, I'm a Brooklyn kid. He started um, rhyming in the schoolyard after school one day. I wanna be in the circle of hip hop niggas. So I go over there, I started beatboxing for him. Mm -hmm. Small fucker started dissing me while I was beatboxing. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So he, he was on your beat talking shit about <laughs> you. He disrespecting the shit out of me, son. I'm doing the beat for the small fucker <laughs> and he blacking on me because he want to make sure that people see the new kid from Brooklyn ain't that dude. I'm that dude. I ain't had no raps for his ass that day. And I'm fucked up because I'm like, damn. 
do I stop doing the beat while this nigga's dissing me and smack say, the shit out of gonna... this nigga? Or do I just keep doing the beat and not be on no party pooper shit? So I kept doing the beat, I kept it cool. I looked at him after, he tried to dab me talking about he was just joking. Nah, my nigga, I'ma see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Went home, I started listening to mad LL shit. And then I wrote this rhyme called Pulse Rate. And when I wrote that rhyme, that rhyme was the rhyme. I came back the next day and I bust his ass. Immediately he wanted to be in the same crew. Hey, yo, my nigga, you wanna get down with me? <laughs> yo, <laughs> yo, yo, son, yo. So we ended up forming a crew. There was a third MC by the name of Mystery that was down with us. This was before Dinko. Mystery was in the street. He was hustling. About two years passed by. We trying to figure out how to get on. He ain't had a patience. He like, fuck this rap shit. Brown found Dinko, brought Dinko to me. I like what Dinko was doing. And we ended up agreeing to just become the group. Milo, which is the DJ, is my mother's sister's son. So he's my blood, first blood cousin. Brought him in to be the DJ, but eventually he wanted to rhyme too. So it it, it became the four of us. And um, I think we didn't start showcasing Milo could rhyme until we got to Scenario Remix. And then when we got that look, it was like, fuck that, I ain't turning back. I like this shine of being in the front as opposed to being in the back with the two turntables. But yeah, that's, that's that, that, that LL influence was important. Slick Rick was one of my greatest influences. Rakim, EPMD, Big Daddy Kane. And I say that, oh, Chuck D is my, my greatest influence. He yeah, gave your me stage my name. name. He gave me my name. He gave us the name Leaders of the New School. He taught me everything. Like he's he's like my big brother and my father when it came to this rap shit. So I was raised by the, some of the most incredible motherfuckers. Well, I was about to say some. And they used to let me come pull up on them. Like I could come to their crib and ask questions. Ride around in their cars and ask questions. Come to their studio sessions and ask questions. Big. So they really, really embraced. And we was just always super respectful and humbled and grateful to be around them. And we showed them that, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, any other act was blasphemous. You try to disrespect point, a grand right. motherfucking, a grandmaster and this shit, you, you was playing yourself. So, you know, again, being fortunate enough to be around the right places, right time, right people, never even knowing you was ever gonna meet these motherfuckers when they was just your inspirations. Right. Then you meet them and sometimes, you know, they say, don't meet some of your heroes because they might let you down and shit. Not one of them ever let me down, bro. You know what I'm saying? They gave me the nourishment I needed to just become greater and greater. And to this day, I big them up, I pull up on them, I'm finding something that we could do together and that shit ain't never gonna stop. Paying it forward. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tribe Called Quest. Take us through a studio session with you and the brothers. Okay. So he said, okay. <laughs> I got many of them motherfucking stories. So some of the funniest stories would be like, say you go to the studio with Q-Tip. This is the shit that I Rest in peace, Fife Dog. Rest, Rest in, in peace, peace Fife Fife all the time. Yeah, because yes, Fife, yes, sir. Fife Dog, it was kind of like, you know like when you would ask your moms if you could do some shit and she say no? And then you go ask your, your father and he'd say yes. And then you you act like you ain't never had a conversation with your mom. At all about it. <laughs> and then that shit might get them to in a little argument. I used to play Fife and Q-Tip like that against each other. So I ended up on Mad Tribe songs because I don't think people realize how important Q-Tip is on the East Coast. Q-Tip is like the East Coast Dr. Dre. Mm. So many artists and people came through Q-Tip that if we was all signed to Q-Tip, Q-Tip would be the East Coast Dr. Dre financially. Yeah. Because all of us, me, Most Def, D'Angelo, Tribe, so many different things came through Q-Tip. And he just never was interested in signing nobody, which was admirable at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that shit crazy than a motherfucker <laughs> now, now should have yeah. signed everybody. Right. Because he, 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 we all grew through his, 
his tutelage and his, his, his knowledge for music, his productions ability. So every time you go to a tribe session, Q-Tip got the illest beats on the board, him and Ali Shaheed. If he didn't like the beat, and at the time, motherfuckers is recording on two inch tape reels, right? It ain't like Pro Tools where, you know, you could, you could record 99 tracks worth of shit and not erase nothing. You get your 24 tracks worth of shit, you record that shit on a two inch tape reel, and if you don't keep that shit in the right temperature, the tape could get brittle and 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 be destroyed, mm -hmm. right? This motherfucker Q-Tip would record the illest beat, and then if he didn't like it, he would erase the shit off the reel. Nigga, one man trash is another motherfucking man treasure. Right. If you ain't like it, give the shit the bus rhymes, babe. Mm -hmm. Let me fuck <laughs> the beat up. <laughs> but he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't listen to that. So every time leaders had an argument, because after scenario, I became like one of the most sought after dudes for features. Everybody wanted that Dungeon Dragon shit on their songs. So it started to create a little conflict internally with leaders with me and Brown. Dinko was always fine with it. And the understanding amongst the crew was, yo, no matter who get a feature, get on that motherfucker record, shout the crew L O N S, and then go bop, pop your shit. Mm -hmm. The more the more features we do between all three of us, the more we promoting the the click. The overall the team. But everybody, as much as they said cool to that, wasn't really wasn't. That wasn't cool to them if they wasn't getting the same amount of feature <laughs> looks that I was getting. Mm -hmm. Long story short, every time we get into an argument, I would pew to a motherfucking tribe session. But I would always hit Q tip. So a couple of times the nigga Q tip be like, nah, that's a private session. I'd be like, yeah, all right. Nigga Fife live right down the block from Q-Tip. I go to Fife crib. Fife, what up, brother? What you doing? Going to the studio. All right, I'm coming with you. Come on, boss. I ain't telling nigga nothing about what happened <laughs> with me and Q-Tip. I get right in the studio session. Nigga Q-Tip see me. Nigga just look at me with the frown. <laughs> nigga, turn on the beat. I'm here. What we going to do? Turn the beat on, and then I would end up on shit. Oh, my God. Sen uh, uh, scenario. Yeah. Well, we was all supposed to be there for scenario, but oh my God, a song called One Two Shit, Ill Vibe for my first solo album, a song called uh, 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 man. It's a song on the Rhyme and Reason soundtrack that we did. And we, we rhymed over a sample that was done by this producer named Cash Money from Philly. And he chopped up motherfucking music from Return of the Dragon, Bruce Lee movie. And me and Q-Tip rhymed on that. But it's on the Rhyme and Reason soundtrack and I forget the name of it. But my point is I ended up on all of these records with Tribe and collabs with me and Q-Tip because a lot of the times I was just trying to be where I was welcomed when I felt unwelcomed by my own crew. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? And those brothers always took me in and made me feel like I was a part of they. they they crew like a little brother and they was never hesitant to let me get on and rock with them. And I think it was also entertaining because I was in the studio going so fucking crazy just to make sure that I showed my appreciation for mm. them letting me get on shit that I would overdose the spaz out. So I could <laughs> overdose I would spaz OD out. on the spaz out because <laughs> I wanted them to let me stay and then I wanted them to let me rock and then I wanted them to let me stay on the song. And then I always wanted to feel like I was in their group because I was huge fans of Tribe. Tribe probably was the first group that made me cry mm -hmm. when I heard shit that was so fucking dope that I wished that I did it and was mad because I ain't know if I would ever be able to come up with the shit that they was creating. So I would want the shit so bad that I would sit there and listen to this shit and just start crying. Like, I can't believe what the fuck I'm hearing. Try probably the first group to do that to me. Chuck D did that to me. Public Enemy did that to me with Rebel Without a Pause. 
So you you ever heard of the the, the 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 white boy group called Young Black Teenagers? You watched the House Party movies, right? Yes. With Kid and Play, right? Yes. You remember the kid Cameron, the white boy with the with the dreads? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's Jamal. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you imagine that shit today? Just that name alone. Young black teenagers with an all white group today. <laughs> right. But see, that's the crazy shit, right? Hank Shockley and Chuck, they was like mad scientists. They would do shit that they knew was just gonna fucking give, create the old shit reaction. But they had these group names on the wall, on a bulletin board, and they didn't have no group members to fill in the group names. So like these, they had fucking Son of Berserk and the Hellraisers as one group. And they had the logos for these shits because Chuck was ill. I think he went to college for like animation and illustration or something. So he drew these logos and came up with these concepts. Kings of Pressure, True Mathematics in the Invisible Empire, Funky Frank in the Street Force, Leaders of the New School. Did I say Son of Berserk and the Hellraisers? All right, so these is all of these group names they had. And then they had these auditions. So you come up there with your group and everybody start rocking and shit and they'll look at you and be a line of motherfuckers waiting to get on after. They'll look at you and they'll be like, you know what? You fit Funky Frank in the street force. Your man, you fit True Mathematics in the Invisible Empire. You fit Son of Berserk. Y'all looking at each other like, these niggas is breaking us up. And depending on how bad you wanted it, you would do it. Would determine whether or not you was gonna do it. We come up there. We was the Destiny Three MCs. Mm -hmm. Destiny Three. My name was Chill O Ski out this motherfucker. <laughs> name sound trash. I know. <laughs> Chill O Ski. Chill O Ski was my rap name, son. <laughs> and the ill shit is at the time. The three part names was the shit. You had LL Cool J. You had Prince Monkey D from the Fat Boys. You had Cool Rock Ski from the Fat cool Boys. Cool Rock Ski. The three part name, Cool Mo D. The three part names was cool. Human My Beatbox. Th you know what I'm saying? Human Beatbox. My shit was fucked up though. <laughs> <laughs> Chill Ski three part name sounded trash. <laughs> Chill <-o> Ski. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 we come up there as leaders of the new school. Well, as the Destiny 3 MCs, and we saw the name Leaders of the New School, and the, the logo had looked like Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, Leaders was bent over like Raiders, and then of the Lost Ark was of the new school. And we saw that shit. And the young black teenager dudes with the Jamal kid, Cam, he came up there with DJ Scribble and these two other white dudes. I forget their name, but we was all cool at the time. They wanted the name leaders of the new school. And when they tried that breakup shit, like they wanted to put me with Funky Frank in the street for us. I was like, that name don't even sound cool, my nigga. And I'm not breaking up with the crew and the crew ain't breaking up and we all stood our ground. So they respected it. And it was ill because Hank Shockley was like the bad cop and Chuck D was the good cop. And that's how they moved on some bomb squad shit. Eric Vietnam Sadler was one of the main producers. Keith Shockley was one of the main producers. So. They said, y'all want that name? Because both groups wanted the name. So, hey, come Hank Shockley with his bad cop bullshit. Okay, y'all motherfuckers want the name? Then y'all need to go home and write a song called Fuck the Old School. What are you talking about? We not dissing the architects, bro. You heard what I said. Go home and write the record. And whoever got the hottest record wins the name. Obviously, we won record. We won. We got the hot fucking record. Disrespecting all of the greats, <laughs> crying while we writing this shit. Word. Emotionally fucked up. Word. And 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 I don't know where that song is, but I hope that shit don't never resurface because <laughs> we violated everybody. Flash, Furious Five, Crash Crew, Cold Crush, Cool Herc. Africa band, we dissed everybody.
Chilo Ski was spinning the block. Chilo Ski was spinning every block. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, but you know what, man? It was it was a testament to really just it was a testament to how bad we wanted it. Them dudes just was want they just really wanted to see how how much we was willing to go extremely hard to secure the win. And they wanted to see how much we was willing to sacrifice to secure the win. And with all of that being said, Chuck D said, yo, that Chilo Ski name ain't the shit if you're, if you're gonna be leaders of the new school. You gotta lead the new. So you can't have no old ass sounding name, my nigga. Get that shit out of here. <laughs> nigga came through, cause they used to always ask me to bust around too. And why don't you bust around for this nigga? Cause they used to love seeing the animation and the aggressive shit. The nigga Chuck D one day he's like, yo, you remind me of this football player named Buster Rhymes. He used to play for the Minnesota Vikings in 1985. I think he was a wide receiver. And I was like, word? The nigga brought the, 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 the card with the fucking athlete on the card. And his name was Buster Rhymes with an ER. And I looked at that shit and I said, this shit is L, yo. A real dude named Buster Rhymes that played for the Minnesota Vikings. So I took his exact name, B-U-S-T-E-R. Never met him. Never met him. Then when time started to pass, cause I ain't like the name at first, but I thought it was dope. But I just was so much on my, I changed from Chilo Ski to Lord Taheem cause me being 5%, that was my attribute as 5%. But it wasn't nothing unique about it because they had so many other guards with their names as they MC name, like Kim Shabazz and King Sun and you know Lord Jamal from the Brand Nubian. Everybody had this, you know. So when Chuck said be Buster Rhymes, he was like, just try it. If you don't like it, you could go back to all of them names you got. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I gave it a shot, and probably like a year or two of them bringing us to shows and letting us open up for them. They had a lady named Jessica Rosenblum, her and Amanda Shear Demi. Amanda Shear Demi is the widowed wife of Ted Demi who created Yo! MTV Raps. They used to run shit in the downtown area with the clubs. And that's how we was able to perform as leaders of the new school and get the buzz going. Dante Ross, who was that Tommy boy who signed De La Soul in them, he saw us at a club in the Lower East Side called Payday one time, and he was leaving Tommy Boy to go to Electra, and the motherfucker was like, y'all so incredible, I wanna sign y'all. But all of that grooming in the two, three years of being able to go out with Chuck and them and get that schooling and be able to ask questions and learn how to really perform, all of that shit, it was like the boot camp training that we needed before we started getting in these clubs and getting seen. And all of that shit is what provided the opportunity to get the deal. So Buster Moms was born December 15th, 1989, when I was 17 years old. Mm. After being Chelo Ski. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna let you lay that one down. <laughs> Break out, uh, you broke out solo career. What was the price of your debut album, your debut album, the coming and putting together, woo-ha, got you all in check. Talk about that. So, so I was scared to go solo. I was super nice with doing the features. And Why I, were you scared? I was scared because I was never a solo MC. I was always in a group. I was responsible for my 16 bars. And, get and out then the I way. was out the fucking <laughs> way. You know what I'm saying? When you gotta do three 16s yeah. in the chorus for 12 to 14 records, yeah, that's a lot. that shit is a weight. And then you ain't got nobody to really bounce no ideas off of. I'm used to having Brown and Dinko around. I bounce the ideas off of having a nigga tell me, yo, this shit dope, that shit ain't it. Yo, tweak these two, three bars over here. And who I did have those relationships with, like a Q-tip or, you know, Dayline them, I, I was, they was busy. So I didn't, I, I didn't have the same access to them that I would have with my own crew. The thing was though, what, that forced me to figure it out was as the youngest member of the group, I was the first one to have a child. So I had to find my way to provide for my child. So that's when I kind of started ODing with the features and rhyming on everybody's shit. And I used the buzz from Scenario to sell myself and solicit myself to make sure that I ended up on everybody's records because I had to find verse money to keep taking care of my kids. 
until I figured out what I was doing as a solo artist. Once I got to the solo artist opportunity, I remember there's a skit after It's a Party, if you listen to the album sequence in its full form, right? And uh, in the skit, it's like you hear this band like just randomly playing their instruments, like they fine tuning their instruments. And I acknowledge that. And then I do some little short ass freestyle. That was the very first thing that I recorded for the first solo album. And it happened like that because I was shooting higher learning movie at the time. I get the call from Dante Ross. And he told me, because when they did the deal initially, they signed us as individuals as well as a group. So when we broke up, we still were stuck at the label. So he telling me that I'm getting a budget that was way more than what we got for each leader's album. And I ain't had to split that shit with nobody. I was excited than a motherfucker about that. But I wasn't excited about the solo artist responsibility. I called Q-Tip. He come to LA, fuck with me. And we go in the studio. I think we went in like three days straight. I couldn't come up with nothing. I'm angry than a motherfucker. And then this, this brother named Rashad Smith, Tumbling Dice, he produced the One More Chance remix for Biggie. Mm -hmm. um, he produced Doing It Well for LL. He produced Wuha Got You On A Check. He produced Dangerous for me as well. The Wuha sample was played in a Rampage session. Rampage was working on a song and I think Rashad needed a, a horn sample for this beat. He ended up pulling out the Galt McDermott shit, which is the sample for the Wuha shit from the Hair Broadway play soundtrack. When he plays this shit, I'm like, nigga, keep that for me. That shit crazy, my nigga. He make the beat, he loop it. I'm riding around in the whip. First week pass, I don't come up with nothing. Two, three weeks pass, I don't come up with nothing. A whole month pass, I don't come up with nothing. Two, three months pass, I don't come up with nothing. Four, five, six months pass, I don't come up with nothing. By the seventh month, and I got sued by telling this story on Jay Leno. <laughs> I never cleared the sample. And I think Sylvia Robinson's son, he sued me because I told on myself, trying to give credit. So I'm already paying for it. <laughs> so you can tell it now. So I can tell it again. Freely. Rest in peace to Sylvia Robinson's son too, because he passed away shortly after he was in the room with me while I was forced to make a deposition. But in any event, Red Alert was doing the old school at noon on Hot 97. He plays the eighth wonder record by the Sugar Hill Gang. And the lawn, the rhymes, yes, the rhyme, my neck. Woo ha, got you all in check. Uh, let's scream, uh, let's shout, uh, let's turn this function now to keep keeping on. I heard that shit. I called Rashad. I said, I got it. Meet me in the studio tonight. Went to the studio, made that shit the hook, wrote the verses on the spot, song done. We put the shit out, that shit went platinum in six weeks. When I started to see the money from them shows and the money from them royalties and the publishing deals and all that shit, I said, I like this solo shit. And I like the responsibility of a being a solo artist. <laughs> and if the shit takes seven months to write but pay like this, fuck it. <laughs> Let's keep it going. But you know, once you taste a steak coming from canned food, bro, that motherfucking taste bud and that palate change. It's like my whole way of thinking started to change. And you know, I'm taking care of my family. I'm watching baby mom's smile get bigger. I'm watching my mom's smile get bigger. And that's the first thing I did with the success of that, told my mom's quit a job. And once she quit a job and helped me run the rest of my shit, that's probably the most rewarding feeling that I have because that's the first thing I did. Like before I bought myself jewelry and cars and all of that, I took care of my moms because she signed my deal when I was 17.
I could have woke up one day and did some shit to piss her ass off. It would have never been a Buster <laughs> Rhyme signature on that contract. <laughs> and then y'all would have never knew me and I'd have never been sitting here with all the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, big up to Mom Dukes. Yeah, that's so, dope. Uh, yeah, what goes in, obviously you spoke to, you know, your greatness across the board, but obviously on features. What goes into hopping on someone else's song and, and your thought process? Because you have so many you know, songs you hopped on that, that you made magical. Thank not you, not this track. Uh, that was even going and saying, yeah, you're going to go off, but not on this one. <laughs> <laughs> not on this yeah, one. Yeah, for me, it's always respectful competition, number one. But we are always battling, just respectfully battling, you know. I'm going to get on your record, bro, I'm going to give you the biggest hug and a pound, and we're going to joke and laugh before it's time to work. During the work, I'm coming for blood. I don't want no friendship. No, don't talk to me. Nothing. When the show is over, with the bars in that booth, nigga, we could be the best kumbaya in the motherfucking world after that. But that's what it is on every song. And that's what it's been every time. And for me, it's, 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 I think it's, we, we all got this instinctually. Any click we move with, y'all playing on a team, who the fuck wanna be heard by, you don't wanna hear nobody talking about you the weakest link. In no situation. Not on the team when you playing ball, not in a beef if y'all gotta defend each other in a fight, <laughs> right. not in a motherfucking, nothing. You, you, you don't wanna be classified as the weakest link. And it's really, those same instincts I think we all just culturally have been raised with. You know what I'm saying? I just apply that shit in every aspect of my life. And when it comes to these records and how good the game has been to me and these opportunities have been to me, I don't play with it. And another way of showing the most high and showing the person that gave me the opportunity to rock with them that I appreciate it is by putting my best mm -hmm. fucking foot mm -hmm. forward. Got to. Let's talk about some of your your, your classic uh, collabs. I mean, I'm thinking how well they did at the time, but can you imagine this TikTok generation right now? Hell like, yeah. This, oh, it would have been stupid. Hell yeah, and I ain't gonna front. Some of this TikTok generation, they still got my shit Oh yeah, on definitely, stupid. definitely. <laughs> But Thank definitely. you, TikTokers, very motherfucking <laughs> much. <up. laughs> Straight up. Still working. Straight up. Still working. What? Tell us a little bit about each. We're going to try to run through these. Uh, put your hands where my eyes can see. I mean, one of the coldest beats ever. Thank you, Cam. Yeah. Big up to my man, Shamelo D. Rest in peace, Shamelo. Passed away a couple of years ago. He made the beat with my brother, Buddha. And big up to my man, Gerald Odom, a.k.a. Fabrice. He brought the beat to the studio after they made it. So that beat is one of those beats that was an evolution point for me because it's probably one of the first songs that y'all heard me on on my calm shit. You know what I'm saying? And I ended up rhyming on the record on some calm shit because I went to a Diddy session one night at Daddy's house. And back at the time, Diddy told me, he was like, my nigga, why don't you just rhyme on your calm voice, my nigga? Like, Bitches don't want to do that rah, 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 like a Dungeon Dragon shit with you all the time on no song, my nigga. <laughs> Bitches don't want to do that, my nigga. So just calm your voice. T talk to the chicks, bro. Talk to them like, talk on this beat. It's, it's, that shit got room to breathe on it. You ain't got to be, don't always oh, kill them with the flow and kill them with your regular voice. You got a good, you got one of them James Earl Jones voices when you talk in regular. <laughs> and I listened to him. <laughs> and Fat Joe was there too. Yeah, and I was Fat, about that. Fat Joe yeah, was there. Family. And Fat Joe, he was chiming in and, and pretty much telling Stamping. me to, to do the same mm -hmm. shit. That was the record that set mm -hmm. the tone for sure. What's it gonna be with the with the lovely Miss Janet Jackson? Again, bust around some on some calm shit. I just combined it with the speed rap. But That song came about as a result of Janet touring for the Velvet Rope album that she did. She was on Hot 97 with Angie Martinez at the time when Angie was there before she went to Power 105 and she was doing an interview with Angie. And I'm driving from Long Island to the city and at the time I owned a Toyota 4Runner. 
It was my second whip that I ever had. It's 98. I also had a Benz. And I didn't drive the Benz this particular day because I was in a rush and I had 20s on the Benz. And I I was always running into a situation oh, where you hit a pothole. Oh, it's over with. Yeah. That yeah. shit was the most annoying shit. You kept them clean, though. <laughs> Thank so, so, so. Angie asks Janet, what rappers have she never worked with that she would like to work with? She said, bust the rhymes, nigga. I almost crashed my shit. <laughs> I pulled over. And I'm, I'm on the Belt Parkway. I pulled over and I immediately called Mona Scott Young from Violator. And I said, Mona, you need to get in touch with Janet now. She's at High 97. She said she want to work with Busta motherfucking rhymes and tell her I got the perfect song for her. And I ain't have no song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to find a song. And a brother named Delight produced the record. And he got a young lady, I forget her name, to write the hook, pen the hook for Janet. When I heard it, I fell in love with this shit immediately because nothing had sounded like it at the time on the radio. And it was something that it, it, it actually played into me being able to speed rap on it perfectly. So I immediately got the record. Mona got in touch with Janet, sent it to Janet. I didn't write the rhymes yet. We pick a, we, we pick a, she picks the studio session and it's somewhere in a different state from New York. And we go to the studio, and I researched everything that Janet likes. What type of flowers she like, what type of candles she like, what the fragrances is that she like, and we dressed the fucking studio up exactly with all of the shit that she likes. Her security came, they advanced their shit, they walked around, searched every fucking room like they was screening and looking for fucking wiretaps and bugs everywhere. Some president shit. This was probably like three, four hours before she showed up. And then when the queen showed up, I gave her a nice brief greeting, hugged her, asked if she needed anything, and left her with the track with all the vocals on it for her to sing them over. And I bounced. I ain't even want to be around her long enough to do some shit wrong. <laughs> I'm not fucking this moment. Right. Not even by accident. Right. <laughs> Pume it ain't nothing faster than Pume, my nigga. Right. <laughs> <laughs> fuck about it. You know <laughs> I got the fuck about it here. Ain't nothing faster than Pume. Nothing faster than Pume. <laughs> Yo, I went in another room mm. next door and I wrote all the verses and then I spit them. Then I came back and I let the engineer import it in a session. We vibed, listened to it a couple of times. She was happy. I was super bugging out. Couldn't believe this moment was real. And then when it came video to shoot time and that Terminator 2 movie came out and I saw that shit, I said, yeah, this is all that liquidy, make you wet shit, wet dream, all that talk. Call Hype Williams. I said, this is what we doing, big bro. Call Sylvia Rohn. I was scared to have that conversation because when Hype sent the budget back, that shit was $2.4 million for that video. Damn. Most expensive hip hop video ever shot to this day. And that was in fucking 98. Yeah, I was about to say, can you imagine that? Terminated 2 million. And, 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 fucking, and fucking Titanic. The, the the special effects company that did the Titanic movie was called Digital Domain. They did the effects for that video, OD overcharging niggas because they won all them fucking Oscars for the Titanic movie at that time. So there was no negotiating with them. You just got robbed. I mean, the finished product was phenomenal, but it's so funny when you compare the prices to the shit that they charged me then 
to amazing shit that I'm able to do now. Of course, times is different and technology advanced a lot, but it was crazy when you did the research to find out what the <laughs> fuck they was charging you for. Yeah, Why was they charging you like that <laughs> later <laughs> on? <laughs> Not too long after neither. I would say two, three years ago. I, I just was starting to be really confused about why did I get charged like this? And, you know, we was getting so much money, we didn't even care, man. It was like, fuck a royalty. You know, we, we, we getting publishing deal money, millions, and we getting touring millions, and we getting all type of other shit. It was just like, whatever. But again, that was an unbelievable moment. And Janet, by the time it got time to shoot the video, all of that nervous shit was out the window because now I'm in front, front of the camera. I got to make it time look like go. that's my wife. Mm -hmm. that, wasn't, that wasn't hard. <laughs> that wasn't hard at all. That's the easy part. The word is bomb. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nah, but big up to Janet Jackson. Yeah, I ain't gonna front. 2023 writer. was the first time that we got to perform that record. Together together in, in 25 years because last year was the 25th anniversary of that song and that album. So thank you to Janet for bringing me out at the garden where I was able to celebrate 25 year anniversary of that song in my backyard in New York. And I tried to recreate the whole environment in the studio because after the song, I brought all of them flowers and the same shit that we had in the stool. That's dope. On stage to give her her flowers. Hell yeah. Word. I love it. Uh, I know what you want with Flip Mode and, and, and my childhood crush, Mariah. How was that experience? Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> that shit was an incredible fucking experience too. <laughs> Yo, I'm gonna tell you what was what was bug. Me and Split was on a tour bus, and I'm I'm not I wasn't. I'm still not the biggest fan of flying, but I really was fucking not fucking with the flying, and I had built a tour bus in 2003 when I first went on tour with Fifty and Jay-Z for the Rock the Mic tour. And I built a brand new bus from the frame. And we was driving back and forth from New York to LA so much. Mm, that's a push, I think, I think I think I put like 1.7 million miles on this engine. And I had a man uh, uh, that was doing the maintenance and he was our tour bus. It was a couple named Cisco, Kid and Marta Kid, and they from Florida. Well, they from Ohio, but they lived in Florida. Cisco, rest in peace. But he up kept the maintenance on that bus so phenomenally that we never had to put a new engine in that shit. Never. That motherfucking Cisco was a genius with them buses. That bus probably had a Fred Sanford uh, tow yard right now. <laughs> it probably is. Million like, miles on it. Yeah, that shit, that shit had one point seven million miles. That's Damn, crazy. That's Word, but 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 the crazy shit is, we riding on a bus. I got a beat tape from Rick Rock. Big up to Rick Rock from the Bay. And he sends me this beat tape, and we we vibing on the bus, and we drinking all the shit. And, we going cross country and the beat came on and we just, me and Spliff bugging out and I think I came up with the melody first and then the words came later. But when I sent it to Mariah, she was with it off the, off the, off rip. The crazy part though is she goes on these vocal rest periods where she don't talk at all so that you know she don't fuck with her vocal cords because over a period of time we it's it's it's, it's not abnormal for us artists to get pallets on your vocal cords i had to have a vocal cord surgery to remove pallets because the pallets started to get so big they could block your, your breathing passage and at the time when that shit was happening to me combined with being overweight when i was super out of shape that shit had blocked 90% of my breathing passage so I had to get an emergency surgery. And she obviously does the smart thing so she can avoid that with the vocal rest. So at the time when we needed to record the record, we couldn't speak to her on the phone. We could only text her because she was only going to communicate by writing. So we had to wait until she did her vocal rest, which took like three, four weeks or some shit. And when that was done, then she was ready to sing. And when she sang that shit, she bodied it like, super quick, sent it right back, put flip mode on it because at the time I was actually setting up a flip mode album that we was putting out because 
We was on J Records, Clive Davis label at the time. Um, and I had did a label deal there and had a, a project that was almost done with flip mode. But after this album, which came out in 2003, I had did a two album deal at J Records. So I put out the Genesis in 2001, which Cavassier was on. And then, yeah, then this, this song was on the 2003 album. 2003, when my deal term was up after six months of the release, I ended up signing the Aftermath with Dre and got a label deal over there too. So when I left J Records, they deaded the Flip Mode album. But I was using the Mariah song as a, like a single to set up Flip Mode shit so we could just bust ass. And um, that's pretty much how that played out. But long story short, Mariah really, she always pretty much delivers for us. Whenever we, we need her, she's there. Whenever she needs me, I'm there. She just actually brought us out to rock the garden with her as well for her Christmas. You know how she turn it up and give it up for Christmas every year and shit. But she did, she did a couple of shows at the garden and brought me out to, to fuck it up with her and I had a great time. I, Mariah, great. we love you, Queen. Yeah, absolutely. Mar Shout out Mariah. Break Your Neck, Grammy nominated. Uh, live performance is incredible. Thank you, uh, King. Talk to us about that. <clears throat> Before I got to Aftermath, I was shooting Shaft in Canada. And Dre was shooting Training Day at the mm. same time. Was that up there too? Or just shooting at the same time? We was both shooting at the, the oh, movies okay. wasn't out yet. Gotcha. I was shooting Shaft, he was shooting Training Day. We had a schedule where the off days had coincided with each other and I think at the Grammys right before those movie productions was greenlit, I seen Dre. Dre was with a brother named Mike Lynn at the time. Mike Lynn was helping Dre, you know, run with his aftermath shit on the executive level and just going out there and working with a lot of producers and bringing them to the table so that, you know, Dre could scour through the producers to see who was worth bringing on his production team. Mike Lynn was with Dre when I had my moms at this particular Grammys with me. As we was leaving, I seen Dre and Mike Lynn. My mom saw Dre first, and I wanted to introduce my moms to Dre, and then I also wanted to big up Dre, Mike Lynn. He kind of made the whole get together official. I tell Mike Lynn, and at the time I was leaving, like I was a free agent from J Records, and I'm like, yo, Dre, whatever, we gotta do to get in the studio together. I'm gonna make my end of the bargain happen. I don't give a fuck where we gotta go. Dre said, cool. So I'm in Canada, I'm shooting Shaft. I had these off days. I called Dre to see what his availability was. He had off days. I get to uh, LA. He said, I got two days. I said, how many songs could we do? He said, as many as you could record. Wow. I said, what? I get to fucking LA. I go to the studio. I slept in that bitch. Two days, no shower, no nothing. It like when niggas was hustling back in the Reaganomics era, yeah. you sit right in a drug spot, nigga, yeah. you ain't leaving no money unaccounted for. Yeah. I stayed in that motherfucking studio. He put a beat after beat after beat after beat. Out of five songs in two days, three of them ended up on the Genesis album. One called Holla, one called Bounce, and Break Your Neck. Truth Hurts is doing the background vocals on Break Your Neck. And when we did the record, Dre said, this is your single. Like he chose it. He knew. And um, it's one of the biggest records that I made to date, just sales wise and everything, at radio and everything. Like Dre always, you know, his ear is, is, is he got bionic ears. Like he hears shit different from every, regular human in the planet. And then everybody falls in line with the way he hears the shit because, I mean, as we all know, when you hear Dre finished product, that shit got a crystal sparkle on that bitch. It's just so, it's so, 
it, it just sounds different from anybody else's finished product. So Dre is my favorite producer in the planet, along with Jay Dilla. Rest in peace to Jay Dilla and Q-Tip. Oh, can't forget DJ Scratch too. My four favorite producers in the planet. I got other producers that I love, but those are my four favorite. Oh, can't forget the big up Knots too. Knots the ruler from Virginia. Swiss Beats, Timberland, and Pharrell. I can't stop this. <laughs> I can't can stop this grace. list. You know what I'm saying? Great. Last but not least, look at me now. Chris Brown, Wayne. Um, how that track come together? Because that's different generations. I'm going to tell you how that shit came together for me. I'm in Platinum Studios, which is Jerry Wonder Studio in Midtown Manhattan. I was working with an artist at the time who we had did a remix for his song. And on the remix, there's a few MCs and Nelly was one of them on the song. I think Method Man was on it, uh, Cameron was on it. So Nelly coincidentally was working in a room next door to the room that I was in. We on the same floor. So when I find out Nelly was over there, I go over there, I dap him up. I say, yo, we mixing the record. So you should come over and approve how your vocals sound before we print the mix. He goes, cool. He come over to the room, he hear the verse, he happy with it, he go back in his room. When he go back in his room, the look at me now beat is playing, but I couldn't hear it the way, you obviously gonna hear it when you walk in the room, but the 808 is so heavy on that beat, this shit was rumbling through my room, and I was like, what the fuck this dude is playing in his room? So I just got on my nosy shit, and I crashed the session, and when I got in there, Breezy was in there. He playing Look At Me Now for Nelly. And he's speed rapping to Nelly. And I looked at Breezy in, in a jokingly manner. I'm like, nigga, you don't know what you fucking doing with that speed rap shit. Let me show you how to keep the dice rolling when you're doing that thing over there. <laughs> that's exactly what you say on the song. <laughs> that's, that's exactly. Yeah. That's how it ended up on the song. Cause when I was saying it to him jokingly, Fucking around, right? He was like, What you just say? But I said, nigga, you don't know what you're doing with the speed rap shit. And you need to let me show you how to keep the dice rolling when you're doing that thing over there, homie. Mm. Cause you don't know what you're doing with mm. that thing, nigga. He goes, I need you to say that shit again to me while I'm speed rapping. Interrupt me. Say that shit and then just go crazy. I said, fine. <laughs> <That's hard. laughs> Give me the beat. I go back in my room, scribble a verse up, two hours done. I record the shit. I come back in the room. I had like towards the end of the verse, I would say like within the last six bars, I had like two or f four bars where I kind of slowed it down from the speed rap because I felt like I OD'd so much. I'm like, I might need to let niggas get a breather before they catch a seizure in this bitch. So. I, I played it again for him. He goes, why you slow it down? I need you to spaz through the whole shit. You going crazy. Could you just make that adjustment, please, boss? I'm like, this nigga telling me how to go write my shit. Fuck it. I'm going to go. I'm, I got you, King. And when I made the adjustment, I came back. That was the end of that. Next thing I hear when the record is finished, there was no Nelly on the song. Little Wayne got on the song. So I hit a record. I heard Little Wayne go bad like that too. I was like, this shit crazy. Time to shoot the video. We shoot the video. Video come back looking phenomenal. I'm like, this shit is crazy. Did I know that the motherfucking world was going to react like they did to it? Nope. But I'm going to tell you who was very, very instrumental in that record becoming what it was besides it being dope. And I have to credit this woman with being the first one to probably ever invent the challenge that now exists on social media when everybody want to do a challenge. Ah, uh, okay. And she wasn't even doing it as a challenge, but it evolved into that. 
when Angie Martinez was on Hot 97 and she was decorating her motherfucking, dressing her Chinese food with the duck sauce and the hot sauce. And while she was doing it, she was spitting the shit and DJ Enough was behind her and DJ Mr. C was behind her and like the whole staff was behind her turning up and she just there spitting the shit. I feel like I'm running in, I feel like I gotta get away, get away, get away. No one to pop in, I'm gonna win every day, day. See the way they really wanna pop me, just know that. And she blacking while she dressing the food. It made it seem like, damn, a woman learned this shit before me? And I'm a dude? And I karam? And when that shit hit the internet, it just spread like wildfire. And everybody else jumped in and wanted to do what she was doing. So Angie Martinez, the voice of New York, as far as I'm concerned, is the founder of the challenges. Learning Look At Me Now first, it definitely had motherfuckers and they feeling that a, a woman got it together before dudes was mm. able to get it together. Yeah, Chico Bean sure think he the man. <laughs> Yo, big up Chico Bean too, because yeah, he, he killed did. it. But he killed it, he yeah, killed yeah. it. Angie got him first. Yeah. Chico Bean, you definitely did your thing, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you who else. What's his name, man? Let me. Yo, pass me a pass me. Look on my gram real quick. I just got to big up this dude because this is the most recent dude to body it the most. And I've seen a married couple kill it. I've seen a wife do it at, 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 at performing. I don't know if it was their wedding or whatever. But you see the dude that's on the that's on my gram. He's he, he did this shit like he was an auctioneer. I think I've seen You've that. You've seen that, right? I think I've seen that. Yo, that shit was so crazy for the bro that he actually put up a post about how that shit got like 30, 40 million views. And mm. when I posted it, it helped it, it helped contribute to the to the way it went viral for him so much. I just want to acknowledge his name correctly. You got you got his, you got you got the post, bro? Give me my give me your phone. All right, here you go. His name is Crank Lucas. Crank Lucas. Crank Lucas. <laughs> Dope name. Yeah, Crank Lucas. Crank this Lucas. is incredible. <laughs> I like that. Crank At Lucas. Crank Lucas. We I like that. You, yeah, that shit is dope. Word. I know, right? that shit. Hey, but he was a bunch of different characters. He, he was like three characters. Word. In the shit. That, that shit, shit is shit hard. Dope. He killed that shit. That's hard. Obviously, getting a chance to uh, meet or, you know, become friends with Biggie early. Uh, give us one of your favorite Biggie stories. One of my favorite Biggie stories. One day there was an accountant by the name of Burt Padell. Burt Padell was like the dude that everybody used to have to go and pull up to to get their bread from when it came to like labels and shit. He was like the the top shelf accountant for all of like the big executives at the time. I've had to go to get some of my bread from features that I've done from Burt Padell. It was one day Biggie was over there getting a feature. We're not getting a feature, getting a check from Burt Padell. And we was riding back to Brooklyn. And I ended up going to Burt Padell. I saw Biggie. I asked Biggie where he was going. He said he was going to Brooklyn. I said, you need a ride? He said, yeah. So he came in the whip with me. We jet back. We go to Brooklyn. I go to his crib. When we get to his crib now, he let me hear the Ready to Die album. The fucking crazy shit is, while we there, he told one of his niggas to let everybody know that he got the Ready to Die album done and he he about to give it to everybody in the street. So niggas, you know, he already popping with the fucking kick in the door record and all of these shits is playing as like the singles to build a momentum or whatever. And Biggie feature game was crazy because Diddy had him on 112 shit and Total shit and everybody else shit. So it was like extremely intriguing and strange to me at the time because this is during the time where you, you you would beat the fucking bootlegger up for selling your shit for five dollars biggie had the hood lined up in front of his building like a crack spot but he was giving it to niggas for free he wasn't even selling it and i, I couldn't understand bro what are you doing Nigga say, yo, bus, I'm gonna make sure that the nigga that don't got my album look like he the hater. <laughs> <laughs> yo, I was the illest way of thinking at the time. 
because it was brilliant marketing. Mm -hmm. You already get promo shit to give to DJs and certain motherfuckers for free anyway because you need them to play it to advertise that your shit is out and that it's hot, right? He took it to a whole other place. He had the double cassette JVC box in the crib and he was dubbing his own fucking tape and just giving the shit away mm. for free. Free promotion. Free promotion. It was most one of the most brilliant marketing schemes I've ever seen. And that was one of those that was one of those incredible moments. One other incredible moment, and I never told this story, not on the record. Oh, the smoke. So there's a song in the middle of the Biggie and the Tupac beef, and he recorded the verse in my studio session. The studio was called Soundtracks. The studio was located Broadway between 21st and 22nd Street. At the time, I thought it would be brilliant to have these three MCs on a Jay Dilla beat. As I mentioned, he's one of my favorite producers to ever exist. First studio session, it was at a studio called Unique Studios around the block from Quad where Tupac got shot. This was a studio that Easy Mo B, another one of my favorite producers, he produced Flavor In Your Ear and many other classics, did most of Ready To Die. He used to work in the studio a lot, so I ended up booking this session, and the song was supposed to have Nas, Method Man, Biggie, and Busta Rhymes on the same record. record. Mm. J Dilla beat. I got a $10,000 check in my pocket for Big. I think Big just got into the car accident with C's, so his leg was fucked up, and the elevator wasn't working. Big come in the studio, he downstairs. Yo, I'm here, boss. I said, all right, well, the elevator just stopped working, so you you gotta come up the stairs. I said, Meph and Nas here. He was like, a word? Tell the bros I said, what up? But you ain't gonna see me tonight, my nigga. Fuck, I look like climbing up them stairs. My size and my foot fucked up. I said, my nigga, I got your bread. Nigga, I don't give a fuck if you had a trillion dollars upstairs. I ain't coming upstairs tonight, boss. Nigga <laughs> <laughs> Big said, fuck you and fuck that. And Biggie bounced. We had another session. We in the same studio. No big. Interestingly, I don't know if anybody wrote their rhyme or even a piece of it, but nobody laid they shit because motherfuckers wanted to see what Biggie was going to do. Never got the Nas and Meth verse. I go to Soundtracks the third day. Elevator's fine. Big and C's come. They pull up. Meth and, and Nas came two days in a row now. No biggie. So they was not coming on the third day. We in the motherfucking stool. At the time, Branson is selling the most incredible bud in the hood. <laughs> and he was selling them in these jars that look like motherfucking pickle jars. Mason jars. Mason jars. C's would roll the blunts and Biggie would come with the Branson jars. And he rolling weed, blunt after blunt after blunt. And Biggie just sitting in the, one of the studio chairs that got the wheels on it that roll around. He's sitting in that shit just doing this while a beat was playing. One hour, two hours, he just smoking. He ain't writing nothing. So about three hours in, I'm just like, my nigga, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna do this verse, my nigga? The nigga said, I'm ready, boss. I said, ready, you ain't write shit. I'm ready, boss. Nigga go in the booth, he does the verse. Diamonds on my neck, chrome drop top, Nigga on the scene, like pound of green, ooh wee, you see the ugliest, money hungriest, Brooklyn Loch Ness, nine millimeter wand test, comfort test, and that, and the winner is not that thinner kid, bandanas, tattoos, my skin never bruised, laying still, cruise Frank White, so you know what he doing, <laughs> yeah, you know who he going at, oh he shooting, and, yeah, and that's your guy though, that's my guy, yeah. 
And <clears throat> he goes, and this other party goes, he goes, Kai, uh, actor needs chiropractor for crack jaw. Yes, I rocked your chatterbox. Dangerous, you're not. I gets down. Twist your body round and round. Mm. Upside down. Mm. I said, big, I ain't putting this out. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't putting this out, big. <laughs> because Pac was my friend too, right. man. Right. Pac choked the sound man out for me at a college show when we was leaders of the new school because we got there late. The nigga turned the equipment off and wouldn't let us get a sound check. This nigga Pac ran up on this man and just choked him. We only got one album out. He calling us legend. He's still dancing for fucking digital underground. We ain't legends yet, but in Pac eyes, we was the legends. I love these niggas, man. I got to be the mediator. I can't add fuel to this fire. I ain't put it out. So when Big Pass, Pac Pass, Diddy working on the Born Again album. And if you listen to the Born Again album, Biggie was, Diddy was looking for verses that might have been laying around that was never released commercially that Big had recorded. And I told Diddy that I had this verse for a long time. So. When Diddy wanted the verse, I said, you got to give me back the money that I paid big. You could have the verse. Because I already know that, number one, I wasn't putting it out with the, the back and forth. And I also knew that once Biggie passed, whatever was going to happen with Big, Big Moms needed to sanction it. She needed to bless it. She needed to be okay with it. I knew Puff had to clear it. So I wasn't going to be able to put it out anyway, even if I did do it the way that I ended up doing it on the Born Again album. Because if you listen to the Born Again album, there's a song called Dangerous Some Seas. And I told Diddy, if I give you this verse, I need to control this record creatively. So I went and got one of my favorite producers, Knott's the Ruler from VA. He gave me one of the craziest beats. Snoop, Mark Curry, myself, and Biggie is on the song. But in the lines where Biggie might have said something to Pop, I muted those lines and I put bars there to cover up those disses. So it sounded like me and Big going back and forth. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's one of the gems that the world finally got to hear about. Wow. Oh, that's dope. So y'all getting that story from the motherfucker. Y'all getting the real that. smoke yeah. now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> quickly, quickly speak on, or not quickly, speak on your relationship with Pac. Yeah, my, my relationship with Pac was super duper beautiful. I'm gonna tell you something. Biggie and me was closer than me and Pac. But my relationship with Pac was incredible. This is, this is the moment when I knew me and Pac was really solid. While I was shooting a higher learning movie, me, Pac, Omar Epps, we all stayed in those Oakwood apartments, them fully furnished shits in the, in the West Coast. But this one in particular was on Hollywood and Fuller. And, um, At the time, I think me and Pac stayed on the same floor. So I would come out of my apartment, walk down the hall, bust a left and go to Pac apartment. We both was on the first floor. During this time was when a lot of the crazy shit started with Pac. Jack the Rapper in Atlanta, and he sent his motherfucking 6'4 down there, and he ended up shooting the cop, the off-duty police. Pac was staying in the Oakwood Apartments in Hollywood and Fuller. When Pac got back from that, Pac became super paro because he felt like the cops was going to be out to kill him no matter what state he was in. So he had gotten wild arsenal. He kept an MPC beat machine in the crib, and like, 
I literally watched them write about seven songs to the same Osley Brothers sample. And each song was about different shit. I couldn't understand that. After a while, I get tired of hearing a motherfucking beat. I don't want to hear that beat to write no more songs to it. I write the one damn song to it, I'm off the damn beat. He wrote seven songs of the same beat. The next thing that was happening to him, or that did happen to him, and we used to just build all the time and just smoke and chop it up. But the next thing that happened to him that I, I had to play a, a, a role in was before the Source Awards was on TV and before the Source Awards with the shit which, with, 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 with Suge and all of them towards Diddy. You know, at the time, we would perform off of these DAT tapes, right? So it's not like an instant replay or like the Serato where you could just press the button and shit start over, right? You got to rewind that shit like a cassette. It's like a mini VCR tape, right? It's called DAT tape. Digital audio tape. You press that shit and it goes. If you don't go with the motherfucker, you miss your placement. Yeah. So if a motherfucker press play, you just go. So Tribe had won Best Group Award at the Source Awards at the time. And while they was doing their acceptance speech, whoever the producer was of the show, this nigga pressed Pac's dat. So it looked like Pac came out in the middle of their acceptance speech on some fuck them shit. So he looked like he was dissing Tribe because he just came out performing on the top of their acceptance speech like he didn't care that they just won the award and they trying to do their acceptance speech or whatever. That shit led to instant beef. So Tribe and some of the Zulus, they stepped the Pac and that shit almost became something. Pac comes back to LA and, and calls me and tell me, come holler at him because he know how close I am with Tribe. The world know at this point because you know, scenario and all of that shit. And we, we, you know, everybody only see me with Tribe. Or one thing or another, I'm with Tribe, right? So Pac calls me and Donnie Simpson was on BET still at the time. Yep. And Tupac, when I get to his crib, he just was like, yo, bro, you know, this, everything I just explained to you, he explained to me. He was like, you know, I would never diss Tribe. Like, I love them niggas. Them niggas don't be disrespecting nobody. And I'm fans of their fucking music. Them niggas is incredible. You know, they, they pressed my dad. I thought it was time for me to go, so I just went. You know what I'm saying? I ain't know what was happening with the speech and all of that. So I want you to, if you can, get me on the phone with Q-Tip so I can let them know it wasn't intentional. I got them on the phone. They squashed the beef. The arrangement was they were supposed to do something on BET to make a public truce so that the world could see them showing each other love and embrace. And I think it was supposed to happen on Donnie Simmons or with Rap City. I don't know if Rap City was on yet with Tigger. That's how earlier this shit was, because Donnie Simpson was video soul. He was video soul and Higher Learning came out January. It came out early 94. So I don't know if Rap City was on then, but Donnie mm -hmm. Simpson, I knew the, the he was talk running was to go on his shit. Yeah, he was, he was running, running the show. And and the, 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 the coordination for them to get around to it didn't happen and then Pac died two years later in 96. So they never got the chance to squash it for the world. They squashed it in front of each other, but they really wanted the world to see it because Pac, real, real shit, Pac really was on some, he loved the East Coast so much that he was doing a One Nation project where it was a bunch of East Coast niggas rocking with West Coast niggas. Greg Nice and all of them was involved with that project. Buckshot, BDI, you know, he was involved with that project. It was a lot of New York MCs rocking with West Coast MCs under the vision that Tupac had to create this unified front and call this shit One Nation to, to settle down the East Coast, West Coast shit. You know what I'm saying? And he didn't get to see that through yet neither. I mean, them songs still exist. That project is still around. You know what I'm saying? And and I got I got I got a few of them sessions in my own hard drive. You know what I'm saying? Because I was supposed to get on a few of them songs. Um 
But the, the point that I'm trying to make is from choking a motherfucker that wouldn't let me get my sound check done when I was in Leaders of the New School all the way to, and mind you, Leaders broke up in 93. So we talking like 92, 91, this shit happened. All the way down to 94, 93, 95 even. I would say 94, 93. Him wanting me to play a role into squashing this shit with him and Q-Tip, it just, it's a testament to how much of a respect and a, and, a, and a love that we had for each other because we helped each other be solution based on shit. Like even when he got into the beef with the sound check, man, we were straining him like, my nigga, we don't want you to get in trouble over some shit that ain't worth it. We ain't never... It was never about doing shit to be advocates of creating a problem. It was always advocating to find solutions to solve problems. And that was the relationship dynamic with me and Pop and with us and Pop. And, you know, again, at that time, the mentality was different. Nobody was on some, yo, let's get on the gram and air nigga out or get on the record and air nigga out. Nah, niggas called each other and wanted to pull up and figure this shit out. Like, what's what's really good? You know, if it's going to be something, then let's settle it this way and get it over with. You know, we ain't got to, nobody got to get shot. Right. Nobody don't even got to know. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. Let's just handle it the way we're going to handle it and stand on business. And that was it. And missed them days, but mm -hmm. we still uphold those integrities and, right. and those morals and principles mm -hmm. on this side. Believe that. What is your thought? And you don't have to go too deep into it, <clears throat> but obviously kind of being neutral as far as having love for two of the main people in the East Coast, West Coast beef rivalry whatever whatever you want to call it how, how how did you play that or did you just step all the way back and just watch nah I, I i i did everything that i could at the time i wasn't able to have the same access to pop so i i i i had no real influence in the situation with when it came to him like when he got around death row it was different you know what i'm saying biggie i was able to speak to him and the beautiful thing about Big is he didn't even really want to respond to none of it because he loved Pac. And true story, he had a lot of appreciation for shit that Pac gave him as gems to help evolve his way of thinking to become who he became. You know what I'm saying? Pac was obviously out before Big. You know what I mean? And when they got super cool, you know, he was able to give, give Big some game that Big was able to apply in a real way. And he loved and appreciated Pac for it. You know what I'm saying? I think Big was more hurt than disrespected. Like he felt more hurt, you know what I mean, than anything. So it wasn't hard to have those conversations with Big because Big really just wanted it to, to, to he wanted to settle it. He didn't want to provoke it, you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of challenging to talk about it because, you know, I know certain shit that I'm not gonna disclose that sometimes it's interesting to hear young dudes, you know, speak about the situation and they don't really know what they are talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like, Biggie and Pac, they had absolutely nothing to do with what happened to him. You know, Pac got involved with shit in New York that he should not have because of his desire to want to be accepted and loved by his thugs. And sometimes every thug ain't pro your movement mm -hmm. for the empowerment of mm -hmm. thugs. <laughs> Some of them gonna look at you like a burger or a frankfurter with fucking hands and feet. Yep, you gonna be a And big. you become food to them. Mm -hmm. And situations can get manipulated for you to fall into certain mm -hmm. traps. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, something of that nature could have been avoided if bro just would have moved a little different. I just don't like that it ended up bleeding into it becoming this Biggie and Pac thing when it really wasn't even about Biggie and Pac. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know At least not the shit that happened to Pac. The, the shit that Pac I guess was disappointed in was completely separate from any of that, which it was so simple and petty, they could have spoke and resolved it. 
So with that being said, I really wish that I was able to have a stronger influence knowing the real dynamics of this shit. You know what I'm saying? But ultimately, what we what we know now and what we have the ability to do now is keep the motherfucking thoughts and all of the ideas that they spark the thoughts in our minds and the greatness of their legacies, we're going to keep them shits alive forever because them dudes is both heroes to me. So you talked about your health, uh, your health journey. Where were you at mentally and physically? Uh, you said um, it really hit you when your father passed. Yeah, I, I didn't know how to deal with my father passing at all. You know what I'm saying? For two reasons. I think the first reason was I never experienced the death of a family member that close to me prior to my father passing. Yeah, I had aunts that passed, you know, grandparents that passed. You know, I've had cousins that passed, but your father, there's nothing that could replace that, nothing could replace your mother. So that was weird to me, and I didn't know how to deal with it. Second thing was, you know, like I told y'all, my father wasn't the biggest fan of the rap shit. He wasn't really supportive of, you know, I was able to talk to my moms about the first time I had sex and shit like that. Like my moms was super cool. She would, she would, she would really encourage being truthful and 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 being comfortable in my truth. You know, with with her, my pops. I talked to him about getting some ass. He's like, he don't want to hear that shit because he. You need to be focused on the shit that, that's going to help you. You got time to get with girls and shit. Like, get your school shit to. So that that mentality with my pops, I learned to appreciate it later because he just wanted the best for me. At the time, I just was like, you ain't fucking with me. So it, it made me not feel like fucking with him. And when he got sick, because he caught a heart attack, and uh, he caught two heart attacks. The second one is really what fucked him up, but I was also having conflict with my brother, my only brother, and my pops didn't want nothing more than for me and my brother to squash shit before he passed. And between having my frustrations with him as my pop and my brother, I was on some fuck that shit. And I'm grown and I'm paying my own bills and I'm taking care of my whole family. I'm doing this shit on my terms, which was selfish and it was stupid. So by the time I get, I got cool with my pops, it wasn't long enough for me to enjoy him before he left. So I lived with, I lived with that guilt for a long fucking time. And that shit led to me drowning myself in work, drowning myself in smoking, drowning myself in drinking, drowning myself in staying out late because I ain't want to be angry around the kids or angry around my woman at the time that was living with me. And I just was a grouchy motherfucker and extremely unhealthy. So all of this shit that I was doing, it made me gain weight to the point where I was the heaviest I ever been in my life. And I, I got to 340 pounds. And I was looking fucked up. And I was feeling fucked up. And then I think just hearing that shit from my immediate circle of loved ones is what really started to make me feel crazy because now you ain't the cool pops no more. You know what I'm saying? We concerned you, this ain't, this ain't, this is not the person that we love. You something, you turning into some other shit. You know what I'm saying? So when I started to hear that shit, that's when I was like, I right, I gotta figure this shit out. And then the shit that really hit the fan, I think, um, I was shooting a video for Czar, which is the first single on my second, my last album, Extinction Level Event 2. And my stomach was so big that the stylist at the time, which was a brother that I've been working with since like not too long after Put Your Hands With My Eyes Could See, who came through June Ambrose, the legendary stylist, To, to, to make my stomach not look so big, these motherfuckers had to duct tape my stomach down, son. This shit was the most embarrassing shit. Literally, like, the big, 
thick silver tape. She, it wrapped a, a thin saran wrap around my shit so that the tape wouldn't be against my skin. The duct tape, son, and, and, and walked around my body, taping my fucking stomach down, son. So I wouldn't look <laughs> as crazy as I actually look <laughs> in the right? visuals. Crazy. That shit was the worst fucking feeling ever. Video turned out banging. That same night, I think it was the anniversary of Biggie Passion. We go to this club called Poppy's in LA. My bro Fred Matters is DJing. And I'm getting super drunk celebrating the video, honoring Biggie life. I overdid it to the point where that combined with sleep apnea and the pallops on my throat. I couldn't breathe properly. And then you drunk, so you sleeping heavier and deeper when you drunk. We get to my crib and the security couldn't wake me up. My oldest son who works at Black Rock, who was the three-year-old in the Wuha video, who's now 30, at the time when he was my, my road manager when this happened, this all transpired in like 2018. 45 minutes it took for them to wake me up to get me in the crib. He got so scared that he told the security everything that he felt he was too scared to tell me because he ain't want to hurt my feelings. So he asked them to say it to me. And they said it to me the next day. And the next day was when I went to the doctor about my breathing because I felt the shit weird the next day. And that's when the nigga... He stuck this shit in my nose and went down into my throat. And he's like, oh my God. Nigga just kept saying, oh my God. And I'm like, you gonna say fucking oh my God again and not tell me what's going on and what you saying? Or you gonna tell me oh my God and tell me what you saying? He like, you gotta go to the emergency room because 90% of your breathing passage is blocked. If you go to the crib and take a shower and your central air system is on and catch a cold, at last 10% of your breathing passages get blocked, you won't be able to breathe. You will like be drowning above water. I said, I ain't going in no ambulance. He said, okay, well, you got to sign this agreement right here because I want to make sure that I'm exempt if you leave and something happened to you. You're not suing me because I'm telling you what to do when you ain't listening. I went straight to UCLA Medical. Big up to Dr. Chetri. Dr. Chetri is the one who saw my shit, kept me in there for two days, prepped me for the surgery did the surgery, told me to go home. Now you gotta go on vocal rest like Mariah for the next two weeks. And I did it. Came back, I ain't have to see another doctor about a palate problem, went and lost weight, transformed, turned into my little Hercules shit. Then after that, I got comfortable and gained my weight back a little <laughs> bit. And then I went on tour with 50 and I came off of that motherfucker weighing probably the, I'm probably the lightest I've ever been since leaders. And right now I'm at like 226. When I went on that tour, I was 260. I think I'm gonna come down about 10 more pounds. And I might throw the action figure nigga back on me, 15 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> might as well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Might as well. But 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 yeah, it's, it's, it was it was tough dealing with the loss of pops. Mm -hmm. Like that shit was. Yeah, it's a domino effect. Oh, yeah, it's it definitely effect. led it, it domino yeah. affected yeah, every yeah. single thing else, bro. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, higher learning, Ice Cube, uh, a classic. I think y'all shot that at UCLA, right? Yes, we yeah, did. Yeah, my school. Uh, talk to us about that process. I, especially just, I always picture just y'all beating the skinhead's ass. <laughs> talk to us about that movie and just that process. Yo, I'm gonna be honest with you. That was the most incredible experience for me because that was the first time like I had a, 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 a co-starring role, number one. So I was super gassed by that. I was super gassed with working with John Singleton. All I was thinking about mm -hmm. was just the legendary Rest Boys in the Hood, yeah. Godfather. Yeah. And he was putting all of us in position of power more than any other director ever. The MCs, you know what I'm saying? The yeah. black actors, whether you, you, you didn't have to have no skill set, no film or television acting history. He believed in you enough to pull something out of you to execute the job. And he put you in position. So I salute John Singleton and made John Singleton's soul continue to rest peacefully. But I'm gonna say this, 
The thing that I learned for the first time on his set was how motherfuckers stay in character even when they say cut. That shit was weird because I ain't understand it. And when niggas say cut, I knew how to get back to Buster Rhymes. I knew how to get back to Trevor Smith. I knew how to get back to Lord Taheem. I knew how to get back to Chillo Ski, my nigga. Chillo Ski. <laughs> you, might see you, know of, you might see all of them one night. Or you might see all them niggas <laughs> in one night like, yo, yo, yo. So, so the dude who was the leader of the skinheads, I forget his name, but he's a super known actor, super successful actor. But the leader of the skinheads who, you know, convinced Michael Rappaport to become a skinhead, he stayed in character the whole film. This motherfucker used to come on set and go into the trailer with like Nazi paraphernalia that he brought himself. That shit used to bug us the fuck out, bro. He would walk past you and not say nothing. Like, fuck you looking at, nigga. Like, he was on it, on it, for real. Like, so, and he was the nicest dude in the planet. Like, but he just stayed in character the entire film. It really wasn't until it was done that he interacted with people. And that shit was crazy. Cube, at the, at the, at the end of the day, me and Omar, we stayed in the same apartment complex with, Tupac, which was the Oakwood Estates in Fuller in Hollywood. So we was vibing all the time. And I ain't had, I ain't, I, I ain't know, this was a first experience. I ain't know to have a barber with you, bring your own barber. So I had to use Omar Epps barber. I think Fuck we called him up. Shorty. Fuck your shit up. Huh? Fuck your shit nah, up. Nah, he actually he was oh, killing okay. my shit because <laughs> I, ain't have no, I, I ain't have much to do because I had to dread. The line, right? Yeah. You know, he just give mm -hmm. me a nice line up mm -hmm. and I'm Gucci. Um, But Cube, for the first time, I saw a motherfucker have their studio in their trailer. Like Cube had a full blown studio in his movie trailer. So he was recording on the set. And I, I will never forget this day when Nas second album, it was written, was coming out, bro. That Illmatic fucked the streets up so bad that we was on the set counting down the days to get that it was written album from Nas. Like like the conversation every day when we would come to the set in the morning and eat breakfast and freshen up on our lines and pop our little shit amongst each other. That Nas conversation was every day on the movie set. Regina King, she was incredible. Like I'm such a huge fan of her, super duper proud of her. Like she's, she's one of the best actors and human beings and one of the most beautiful women in the world to me. Super big up to Tyra Banks too. You know what I'm saying? At the time, her and John, I think they was in a relationship and he just was taking care of his people, man. And you know, one thing that I could say about John, not only did he take care of his people cause he came back and got us for shit. Like he got, you know, he put Tyrese in position, he put, Cube in position. He put me in position. Taraji. Taraji. He brought me back for fucking Shaft. Like he he would come back and get us. You know what I'm saying? It ain't like he would just use you one time and that was it. He came back and got you. Come on back. Come, let's do it again. Fuck it. But for 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 John, the reason why I'm really bigging him up is because when you really think about his legacy and you think about Boys in the Hood all the way to Snowfall, homie. I don't know if there's another motherfucker mm -mm. that did it as ill mm -mm. as him mm -mm. from from start to returning back to the essence. He did it to illest. Mm. So mm -mm -mm. I thank John for everything. Rest in peace. Or rest in peace <clears throat> to the king. Um, nominated for 12 Grammys. Still haven't received that trophy. Obviously, your career is decorated and cemented as one of the greatest of all time. You know, athletes, we play to win championships. Grammys is kind of like a championship. Do you feel like you need one for self-validation? Because we already already know what you are, but what would it mean if you were able to get one? I like and I enjoy what I've experienced last year. Because what I've experienced last year in my 33 years of professionally recording, actually this year makes 34, right? But in 33 years of doing it, and I say 33 is because my 33rd year, which is the Jesus year, 
is when I have received my flowers in an abundance that I've never received it in before. From the Lifetime Achievement Award at the BET Awards, me being able to have all of my children since they've been born in the same room together. I, don't, I, never, I never had a picture with all of my kids in the same room until last year. I still have it. You know what I'm saying? My happiness and my joy is at a level that I've never, I never knew this kind of happy existed. Mm, yeah, I love to hear that. That's dope. That's deep. Until last year, bro. And the fucking fun that I'm having, I don't know if y'all know this, but I don't think before last year, I haven't posted as much as I've started posting about the blessings. Like I, every post I talk about, the blessings ain't stopping, so we ain't stopping. Stay blessed. Everything is just, I'm uh, appreciating grateful. Yeah, the way thankful. I'm being blessed. I'm super grateful. And it's just getting more and more incredible, man. Like, I got incredible people that really love a motherfucker. And I want to keep experiencing that. None of that is going to determine the, the, the greatness. I think we do this shit, and the reason why we end up receiving these beautiful things and I always say, you know, ain't no timing better than the most highest time. And God clock is the best clock ever. When we do this shit we love, and it's coming from a place of passion, and it ain't for the bag. You won. You already won. You already won because you're going to do it anyway. Yeah. It's, it's providing something else that the bag probably can't. Mm-mm. It's, 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 it's giving you a fulfillment. Self-fulfillment. You know what I mean? That no, the, Nothing else could give you it like that. But the, the beautiful shit is because you do it from a place of love and personal fulfillment, when you get the bag on top of it, it's a fucking amazing because it never feels like work. You feel what I'm saying? So if I get the Grammys, yes, I'm going to add that shit to the botanical garden <laughs> of flowers I've been receiving Straight like up. a motherfucker. Right. Straight up. But if I don't get it, it don't change the fact that I can still go down in history on my Bob Marley shit. Cause Bob ain't never get a Grammy neither. Mm, you know what I'm saying? But you can't tell Bob Marley legacy nothing. Right. Mm. And I'm comfortable with that too. That's dope. All right, last question before we get to quick hitters. This shit's been amazing. So <laughs> thank you, King. Yeah. Thank the, you, King. Influence you've had on artists such as Eminem, Talib Kweli, K Dot. Uh, you made your mark 33, 34 years now. Um what do you think back when you look, you know, on your journey where it started, where you are now, the people you've encouraged, the doors you've opened, the people you've got to meet? What do you sit back and think about? Because I feel like often we're on the hamster wheel, so we don't get to kind of look back and man, I had a hell of a run. Real you know shit. what I mean? So when you get a chance to kind of sit back and think, you know, what comes to your mind? The first thing that comes to my mind all the time is just how incredible I feel that the Most High has blessed me with this gift and the ability to share it. You know what I'm saying? I think that's why I overwork. I don't miss a day in the studio, even if I'm sick. I go to the studio with my medicine, my chicken noodle soup, my ginger root, <laughs> the whole it. shit. Mm -hmm. And I will sit down and just lay there. Even if I don't feel strong enough to record, I'll go there and just lay down and relax because being in them four walls is therapeutic for a motherfucker. I could think about being the all five, six, seven, eight Avengers combined and I could be that nigga in that fucking studio and can't nobody tell me nothing, and the studio don't argue with you, and the studio ain't talking back and trying to manipulate and over talk you and act like it don't wanna listen. I, I, I avoid all of that when I go to the stool. So sometimes it's, it's the sanctuary where I actually heal quicker because I ain't gotta cater to nothing in there. I'm at in peace, there, at peace. I'm at the most peace when I'm in the studio. Number two, Every name that you just said, they're my favorite artists. I'm going to keep it a buck. I don't think nobody could fuck with Eminem. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry. Dr. Umar, stop it. <laughs> you wildin', son. <laughs> That's all that need to be said, man. You wildin', son. Straight up. And, 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 and there's a lot of shit that Dr. Umar say that I agree with, but this yeah. is one particular one where you way off the kilt, bro. You know what I'm saying? Eminem is the truth, bro. You know what I mean? I actually, I got a song coming out with with, the, with an artist. 
you know, that I had to address about, you know, his testimonial and opinion on Eminem too. Mm, I had mm. to check him on his own song in rhyme form. Ooh. So y'all just stay tuned for that. And I'm a huge <laughs> fan of the artist that I made the record with. That's dope. But the beautiful thing is, what makes these moments special is when you could be honest on these records and we ain't got a front. So don't put yourself in a situation and then ask me to rhyme with you because I'm going to check you and you can't argue with me because I'm the fucking elder statesman and the timeless great. Now, with that being said, Kendrick is my favorite. Eminem is my favorite. Taleb Kweli is my favorite. Luda is one of my favorites. Smino, Jid, J. Cole, Drake, Lil Wayne, Rick Ross. Huh? <laughs> word, word. I got, I got way too many favorites. Rock Kim is one of my favorites. Kane, Slick Rick, KRS One, Chuck D. I'll be here forever going down this list. But what I'm saying is, to the younger ones or the ones that might have came after me, to hear them actually acknowledge and big me up and give me my flowers, whether it's in a conversation piece, it's in an interview, that feeling and the thought that crosses my mind is super humble, humbling and gratitude and, and appreciation. And I'm such a giver of love that even if you don't big me up in that way, one thing I know is the difference between the truth and the lies, the truth don't change, only lies do. So even if you don't speak it, the show and prove does. You know what I'm saying? Not that shit. We know who my DNA is in. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, the great thing is motherfuckers actually acknowledge that, you know, we all take a little thing from each other. I'm not gonna front. Like I could see Kendrick and I could listen to Kendrick and watch Kendrick. And I wanna rhyme with Kendrick because he is evoking an emotion in me. Eminem is the same shit. He brings the best out of me. These dudes bring the best out of me. I, I did a song with Eminem called Calm Down. I sent it to him with 16 bars. He gonna send back 48. You're not doing that to me on my record. <laughs> no. I sent him 54 bars. He sends me back 62. I sent back 68. Who we making a song for at this point? <laughs> yeah, movie. We ain't making no song for the consumer. We just battling now right, the record yeah, of seven right. minutes. That's dope. They ain't playing it in the club. They not gonna play it in the radio. We might get some satellite radio spins. We might get some motherfucking blogs to talk about this shit because it's an eventful moment. But we turned the record that could have been a radio joint into a me and you straight raw hip hop fuck the rules moment. Because we love it so much that the competitive nature we both have forced us to bring the best out of each other. Only dudes like that can cause me to be this way. So I love M, I love Kendrick, I love Talib Kweli and every other MC that I just said. And these is the dudes when they big me up, it just really feels fucking incredible. I'm gonna put you on the spot right here. Name one MC that represents each borough in New York. One MC that reps each borough in New York? Let me think of this one good. Busta Rhymes. I rep every borough. <laughs> Straight up. Because I'm on my New York <laughs> shit. Hat to the back on my New York yeah, shit. Yeah. I'm on my New York shit. Tim's with the shorts on my New York shit. <laughs> Fuck you talking about. I rep the Giants, the Jets, the New York Knicks. Tell her made clothing in my New York stitch. My chick banging, don't you see my New York bitch? <laughs> Fuck you mean? <laughs> I rep all the boroughs, yeah, man. I love it. I love Every it. borough, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> now I said, next question. Who was your, who was your childhood crush? Ooh. Janet. Oh, off gotta, rip, and you got it. Oh my god, off rip. When I used to watch her on fucking good times, good times and even when she was Willis' girlfriend on different strokes, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I ain't gonna lie, to Penny, bro. Facts of life. Yeah. Kim Fields, bro. Yeah. 
She was a mean she one for tough. me too yeah, now. She was yeah. tough. Don't fuck them around the plate. Hey, but I'm that grown makes, now too, y'all. Yeah, right. I'm outside. <laughs> Let me stop playing. Hey, that makes sense though. Why you did the studio the way you did for Janet? Obviously, yeah. you're appreciative, but at the same time, there's a little bit of love in that. Love, yeah, respect, mm -hmm. and and I still had that crush and that yeah, nervous, right? right? Heart that's, why, that's why I had to get up out of the that's way. That's why I had to yeah. get out the room. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Now nah, my my mom's did an amazing job with making sure that being a gentleman was first and foremost, and Kim Fields and Janet, the respect level is so tremendous. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's too. It's so many women I would love to big up. Big up Missy Elliott, man. She oh, she okay. So we, we, so she's one of my favorite. Talk about Missy for a second. She's one of my favorite. I don't think she gets to him. Her and Timbo don't. They don't really get the what they did for that era of music. And, I, I, and I'm gonna be honest. She, she, she's getting her fucking flowers now, brother. Yeah, that's, I love to yeah, hear. You it. know, she, she got the Vanguard Award from the mm -hmm. VMAs. She just been became the first female hip hop artist to ever be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Salute. Salute. Like that shit is the most prestigious decorated award ever. Like hip hop existed 50 years now. They never ever gave it to one female MC prior to her. Wow, that's it crazy. Took 50 Too years. MC yeah, light all no, 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 not one female got up before Missy. It's a testament to what you're saying, though. How much has she has done, and what Tim has done. It's definitely a one of none. There's been a lot of female MCs, but you got to think about it. Like Missy writes for the most successful other artists ever. Produces, smashes everybody with her own shit. She could fuck up the live shows when she feels like doing it, but she got so much money that you will very rarely <laughs> see her on a stage. And her visuals is probably the closest thing that could fuck with anything that I've done out yeah. of everybody. Same yeah. vibe, yeah. Same that's, vibe. That's, that's the female twin sister of Busta yeah, Rhymes. Yeah, it's facts. I hold Missy in the highest regard. I, 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 love, I love that woman in a very, like, she inspires me so much, bro. We inspire each other. You know, I'm, I, I've been putting my shit out before Missy, but Missy, she showed me the same love and appreciation from her very first album. She she was probably the first person to get me on an album and, and, and not even make me rhyme. Like, just get on here and talk some shit and fuck around, Buzz. I just want your voice on my your shit. Vibe, your vibe, your energy, want. yeah. That's you know dope. what I'm saying? Hell yeah. She, she from the inception, of hip hop, Missy's the first one to get the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So hats off to Shout Missy. Shout out Missy for sure. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, yeah, she Go she ahead. she ain't stopping no time soon either. Neither am I. We just yeah. cut from a cloth. They Come don't on, manufacture man. no more, King. Most underrated food spot in New York. Most, Most underrated. underrated food yeah. spot in New York. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it personally, but there's a West Indian restaurant on Utica and Flatlands, and it's called Topaz. They got the wickedest butter shrimp. <laughs> butter shrimp. They have a butter shrimp. They have a curry lobster. They have the wickedest steam snapper with okra and vegetable. Now worry yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked curry chicken patty and regular beef patty and cocoa bread. They have the wickedest oxtail. Yeah, oxtail. That's my line. They got, right all, they got every amazing food. They've been catering all of my album photo shoots pretty much my entire solo album career. And big up to Ali Trush, who's the art director for all of my solo albums up until, up until probably the Big Bang. And then, and Ali Trush is a legend. She did fucking ODB's Return of the 36 Chambers with his picture in the welfare card. Mm -hmm. Nah, like she's a different type of legend with this shit, but she made sure that every photo shoot for every album that Topaz was in the building, trays and trays of each fucking dish that I wanted to eat. So to all of those that get a chance, experience that Topaz experience on Utica and Flatlands and East Flappers, Brooklyn, 
and to the owners and the shareholders of the Topaz Corporation, we have to have a new discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm in, a I'm in a different tax bracket now. Yeah, let's talk, baby. Let's expand. Stuck on the Island, three movies to show in rotation. I want Snowfall. Of course, gotta have it. Fuck that. Fuck that. Gotta have Snowfall. There's a fucking series that only had one season and it was on Amazon Prime. Was it Regina? Uh, nah, the, 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 that was the, on Netflix. Oh, oh, Where the kid seven, died? Seven, seven, seven that yeah. Hard, seven right? minutes, seven right. seconds, seven yeah. minutes. That shit was That dope. shit was unbelievable. I didn't see that. I got to- Check I gotta, it out. I, I gotta, Only one season, one bro. One season, they right? It was, it was crazy. too real. That's why they had to shut it down. My was still talking about it. It was too real. I'm watching that shit tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. that shit was Yo, but the shit I'm talking about, the name of the shit was, it, 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 it was the same name three times with no spaces in between the words. It was a show. Mm -hmm. It was a show about some drug dealers and some some like all this old man mafia that old man godfather that was actually in charge of bringing like this big super out of control portion of drugs to these mafia families because he he took took money from them or whatever and zero zero zero, zero, zero son. There he goes again. Zero, zero, zero. There he goes again. Jim looked it up. Okay, Jim. <laughs> zero, don't zero, give, zero. Hey, don't give too much credit now. <laughs> that shit is crazy. One season. It? it never came back. That shit is crazy. Amazon, right, you said? Amazon? It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, check it out. One season. That shit yeah. never came back. It's super crazy. That's dope. All right, so I got a third one. Yeah. What is my third one? This might just be a movie. This might, might not be a series. I don't know why I love this movie. This movie just did something else to me. But when you said Seven, there's a movie called Seven. Mm -hmm. With Brad Pitt? Yeah, with the yeah. deadly, the, the deadly mm -hmm. sins, yeah. the gluttony and all of that shit. That shit was crazy. That movie was mm -hmm. fucking hey, that, ill that, to that me, yo. That shit crazy, man. That was that Brad was Pitt, good. right? Fucking yeah. ill. They sold yeah. that nigga mouth up. Yeah, Margaret Freeman Cause in the that. So yeah. the nigga wouldn't eat? Cause he was a glutton? Yeah. Yo, nah, this movie was so crazy. But that it be that type of shits that, them action dramas and, and Suspense. Suspense yeah, thrillers. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm a fanatic for them shits, big bro. So yeah, if I was stranded on an island, them three shits is what I need. One guess you would like to see on All the Smoke? But. You have to help us get your answer on the show. <laughs> right. That's the twist. But I'm gonna I'm I'm interrupt this question I normally don't. If you got a personal relationship with Missy, that'll make my whole year. If we bro, get I, Missy. I definitely do. Oh, please. I'm gonna tell you something though. I'm gonna be honest with you. We'll I'm go to her, we'll go her. Okay. We'll go to okay, her. Okay, see, now that's different. Oh, yeah. no, 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 we'll pull yeah. up on yeah. her. You At the Miss yeah. Estate, yeah. your step, I was or gonna somewhere say, else. So that's one yep. thing, she, 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 it's hard to get her to step out. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'll it's step hard. in. Yeah. yeah. Ma she, Missy, we'll step in, respectfully. Yes. No, yeah, shoes I, on, no shoes on, neither. <laughs> nah, that's that's my sis, and and, yeah. and I will definitely reach out. Oh, I appreciate and, that, and, man. And, and I will let her understand this is yeah. not Regular, nah, nah I ain't no Hollywood shit. Rest nah. in peace, Magoo too. Yeah. Well, 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 rest in peace yeah. to Magoo, man. Yeah. Rest in peace to Magoo. Well, he just recently passed, man. It's, yeah. it's 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 crazy. And my mom's always would say, you know, we're not old, but we're grown. And the more grown we become, the more regular it becomes when we see our people pass. Yeah. And um, again, with that being said, motherfuckers take full advantage of the present. That's why it's called the present. And, and and value the present like the same gift that you value when you receive it with the fucking gift wrap and the ribbon on it. Enjoy it the same way. You know what I'm saying? Because one thing the most high don't owe us is another five seconds Talk out this him. bitch. Talk to him. Real shit. So enjoy it, value it. Don't be afraid or reluctant to tell your people or your folks you love them. Yeah. Mm. Fuck that. Bear hugs is is okay amongst men. grown men. Yes, exactly. You know what I'm saying? And 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 women and men, I mean, you know, it's a little weird with the sexual assault shit. Trust me, <laughs> I'll shake your hand before I give you women a hug. But overall, I'ma still hug the ones that I know what my what my hug means. And and I just feel like you know, Missy, we love you. Yes, we do. I'm gonna say it right now. I love all of my fellow brothers and sisters in this shit. Period. And as y'all can see, I don't have conflict with people. Nobody. I don't have those problems. Mm -hmm. I love people. I, I'm a giver of love. We're gonna keep it that way too. In fact, we're gonna step the shit up and keep each other lifted up while we love each other. That's right. Amen. That part. 
Bus, man, we appreciate, I mean, just to get an opportunity. This has been one of my favorite interviews. And and I think the owner of the building, we're sorry. We're probably an hour and a half past due. But we, could, we couldn't turn <laughs> this off. We couldn't turn this yeah, off, though. Yeah, we had to go. This, one, but, man, Whoa, just, this, this was just beautiful, the, man. Uh, you know, the, the chance to obviously be a fan, but, you know, befriend you over the last handful of years and then get to know more about you. Thank you, You know King. what I mean? And, and, and just where, how, how, how you, you know, you, what you've done, obviously, you're accomplishing to speak for themselves. But I think, you know, a better man, if that makes sense. Thank you. Know you. I mean, a great artist and great at a lot of things. But to me, a better man. So it's just like it, it was an honor for you to sit down and, and, and come fuck with us today. Big homie, I'm going to tell you both. I've been a fan. Appreciate it. Thank you. I made me a lot of money on bets. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not even going to front. And let me tell you something. The thing that I love the most about y'all both, and particularly outside of being champions and being boss and, and a part of the elite group of the greatest athletes to ever do it. I love what y'all stand on and represent as black men. Thank you. I'm gonna cause no trouble, but y'all ain't got no problem no. finishing that shit with grace. <laughs> with, <laughs> grace. with grace. With grace. With grace. Make it look good. <laughs> you feel me? I watched, I watched both of my brothers check motherfuckers. <laughs> and this ain't about being tough, it's about being men. Respect. Yeah, and they be it. trying to misconstrue this shit with the toxic masculinity talk and all that fuck shit. No, we got young men, young men children and young men teenagers and young men that still think they um, men, but it's a difference between being a man and being a male. You have a male, yeah, you got your little Johnson swinging between your legs, you got a little legal adult age, you think you a man. You're not a man, bro, you a male. You're an adult male. A man means you could take care of yourself and you can actually assist taking care of other people. Distinguish the difference between the two and stop moving around here like you a man when you not. You know what I'm saying? Being a man, that should come with us standard and it comes with a responsibility that you have to be able to successfully execute and be able to take the good with the bad and the indifferent. And just, you know, live and die on your own iniquity and know that the justice is the reward or penalty for one's actions or deeds. A lot of times niggas don't Talk even want to stand Talk on certain to shit. Talk niggas want to wanna blame everybody else for their shortcomings. Men mm, don't do that. Look in the mirror. Male adults do that. Uh -uh. And until you understand the difference and you could do that, don't talk that man shit to me because mm. I got kids that I got to raise to be men. <laughs> Straight up. You know what I'm saying? I've watched my brothers defend the integrity as men and they will definitely let you know that you can get your face broke. <laughs> but we ain't, we ain't here to start the trouble. Nah. We don't Not, want no beef, life no is good, beef, but we will handle but it. We'll handle it. And it's important that we understand the difference. That gangster shit is not it. Played out. Mm -mm. Be a man. Be man, talk about it. You don't need to be a gangster. You don't need to be trying to fight. You don't need to even get in trouble. Liabilities ain't getting to the bag. You, you, you got the bag running from you when you a liability. Let's, let, let's make it to where being smart is cool again. Let's make it Come to where on, being man. smart is. Yep. Fuck you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let your today's decisions affect your future self. Yeah. You can catch this on all the smoke production YouTube, man. This was another legendary yeah, yeah, Buster yeah, Rhymes in the yeah. building, man. We'll see y'all next week. Yeah. <laughs>